those questions or those type of questions are asked by the defense counsel or anyone, I may expect an objection uh, from counsel, but I would like to know if we can raise an objection as well. I don't want to disrupt anything. I would keep it to that type of issue uh, as opposed to that. But I did want some direction from the court in that regard. So actually, you're not really a party to these proceedings, sir. No, Your Honor. There was an order allowing a support person and the attorneys in the civil cases to be present. That's why I'm here. We do appreciate that. So in principle, you're acting in the position of the prosecutor, but you believe that you might have some unique interest based upon the attorney client court? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Well, certainly the court is going to be mindful of anything that might be violative of the attorney-client privilege, and I have extreme, highly uh, placed confidence in the members of the Attorney General's office to sort of make sure that we're aware of anything that's headed in that direction, and I'm sure that you're going to be bending the ears of counsel for the people to make sure that if they start to head in a direction like that, that they're over it. So, I'll assume that you're going to be in a position to be able to actually formally adjust, but I'm certain that uh, you will be firmly counsel to the people that you believe that something may be approximating those areas. So, I hope the government is quite right. Yeah, and, and obviously, the record is clear that we are not waiving any objection to the attorney class privilege in that regard. Just, we, just for the record, we've had that discussion and I anticipate um, being uh, prepared to adjust if necessary as well. I'm sure that you will. I'm Thank you. Of, I feel confident about that. So, so now 923, are we prepared to actually get started now? We are, yes. Aren't you ready to call your first witness? Yeah, and I call victim C. Victim C? Is there a support person for vacancy or is that person with vacancy right now? They are with victim C. There will be two women um, joining her who are not witnesses. They are, um, my understanding, a sister-in-law and a very close family.
to great directing. Do you swear or affirm that the information that you're going to provide to the court will be posted? Hold up, relatively close to the microphone. We don't have the best equipment, so you have to be relatively close to the microphone so that it captures your voice. So it's my understanding that you don't have a problem with identifying yourself for purposes of the record. Is that true? That is correct. Would you please state your, your full name and spell both your first and last name? Yes, Rachel Denhollander. That's R A C H A E L D E N as in Nancy. H O L L A N D E R. Okay. Question for Ms. Denhollander. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in a nice, loud voice, please tell us your name again. Rachel Denhollander. And Ms. Denhollander, is it okay if I call you Rachel? Yes. All right. Can you tell me how old you are today? I am 32. And when is your date birth? 12 84 um, so you're 32? Yes. All right. Uh, are you married, Rachel? I am. And what's your husband's name? Jacob. How long have you been married? Ooh, going on nine years. Do you and Jacob have any children? We do. And how many children do you have? We have three. And how old are your children? They are five, fresh three, and almost two. Um, can you tell me, uh, do you currently reside in the Lansing area or in Michigan? No, I do not. Where do you live? We live in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, can you tell me what is your um, training or, or educational background? Well, I'm, I am a Juris Doctor and an attorney so I'm certified in California. Um, I want to kind of back up a little bit to your childhood. Tell us where you grew up. I grew up in Kalamazoo. And um, is that where you spent your childhood, your teen years? Yes, it is. Uh, while growing up in Kalamazoo, were you involved in gymnastics? Yes. And tell us how old you were when you started um, participating in gymnastics. When I was almost 12. Um, and how long did you continue to compete in gymnastics? I only competed for a couple of years. I continued training until I was uh, late 15, early 16, and then transitioned to coaching. What um, gym were you affiliated with in Kalamazoo area? At the time I was competing, it was Kalamazoo Gymnastics Club, which is no longer in existence. Um, during the course of your uh, competitive time in gymnastics, uh, what level did you reach? Just level five. Okay. Tell us if you can, um, what is the highest level within gymnastics? Um, ten, and then there's junior lead and lead, depending on the age bracket. So does it go like one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to ten? Yes. <laughs> um, during the course of your gymnastics career, did you suffer any injuries? I did, mostly stress-related versus catastrophic, but yes. Okay. Tell me what that means, is stress-related injury. Just from the continual pounding on the ligaments and the joints that the sport demands. As opposed to an injury as a result of a, of a traumatic event. Correct. Or a fall or something. Okay. Um, did there come a time, I want to point your attention to uh, February 2000, did there come a time that you had suffered any specific injuries in our back? I was having pretty chronic problems with both my back and my wrists at that time. And again, those were related to the stress involved in gymnastics? Yes. Um, did there come a time in um, the early part of 2000, somewhere around early February, that you um, learned of a particular doctor who might be able to help you? Mm -hmm. yeah, there was a gymnast at the gym that I was at that, had, uh, that was aware of Dr. Nasser and suggested, her mom suggested that we go and see him since I hadn't been able to get help from the local sports medicine doctors in Kalamazoo. Up to that point, had you ever heard of a Dr. Nasser as someone that could treat you? Yeah, he was well known in the gymnastics community because of his work with USAG and his, um, his status with the Olympic team. Okay, so back in 2000, what did you understand his, um, his relationship or his status to be with USA Gymnastics? That he was the team physician. Yeah, everybody had seen him help carry Stark off of the floor in the 96 Olympics. It was kind of a household name in the community. So before you went to visit him, you were aware that he was the team doctor for the U.S. national women's team? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And you were aware that he had um, been a team doctor who assisted the 1996 Olympic team, is that correct? Yes, and he was also, I was aware that he was the team physician uh, for Twist Stars and worked with the Twist Stars Gymnastics Club. There was also a local gym in Kalamazoo um, who had an upper level gym this year had suffered a catastrophic injury. Um, kind of the, the rumor that went around the gymnastics community was that Dr. Nasser had told her, had you been following my conditioning protocol, this wouldn't have happened. Um, and so it was kind of 
the general sentiment was if he wanted to stay healthy or get healthy, he was the one to see. Um, did you know prior to visiting him whether he was affiliated with any um, medical program at any university? Yes, I knew that he was an adjunct professor with MSU and that he was the physician for their gymnastics team um, and that he was um, worked for their sports medicine clinic. Okay. And I'm sure we all know at MSU, is, just so we're clear, we're talking Michigan State University? Yes. Um, so when you learned that there was this doctor within an hour or so of your home, um, did you and your parents decide to... Uh, get an appointment with him to see him about your injuries? Yes, we did. Okay. What was your thought process before going to see him? What did you think? I was grateful I had the opportunity. And not, not every level five gymnast gets to be treated by the same doctor that treats our Olympians. And I thought it was wonderful that we had someone that specialized um, in, in that sport. And, that, and my hope was that he could, he could do what the other sports medicine doctors couldn't. At the time um, of that first appointment, uh, and I want to point your attention, do you remember roughly when that was? I'm around early February, I believe. Okay, of 2000? Yes, it was shortly after my 15th birthday. Right. So you were you just turned 15 in December, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes. And um, that was the first appointment in early February 2000? Yes. And where did, where did the appointment take place? It took place at the sports medicine clinic. Okay. Was that with um, near the Michigan State campus? It was on campus. Okay. And in, in the city of East Lansing? Yes. Um, tell me, when you get to this appointment, does anyone accompany you to the appointment? Yes, my mom and siblings were there. My siblings stayed in the waiting room, but mom came back with me. How many siblings do you have? I have two. And are they older, younger, or both? They're younger. Um, tell me about the first time that you met Dr. He came in the room to do an evaluation. He was very, very warm, very engaging, very gregarious. Um, he did a very thorough evalu evaluation of my wrists and my back. He found some things that sports medicine doctors and Kalamazoo hadn't found. Um, my, some of my muscles in my back and glutes didn't fire in the correct order. Um, he identified some shoulder tightness um, that was putting additional stress on my back because I wasn't bending. Um, in the correct place. He diagnosed me with Jacquardine's tendonitis, which was the first time I had a diagnosis for the specific wrist pain um, that I had had. And so he did that evaluation first. So this is uh, happening in an exam room of some sort? Yes. Describe for me, if you can, what's in the exam room. Mm -hmm. there's, a, um, there's a massage table or an exam table um, that's kind of off to the corner underneath the window. There was a chair where my mom would sit by the exam table, and then there was a row of cabinets and sinks with a bit of a countertop on, um, kind of on the left-hand side. Do you remember if you saw any photographs or memorabilia on the, on the wall of this exam room? Not on this exam room, no. Okay. Um, on others, in any subsequent appointments, do you remember seeing any type of um, memorabilia, photographs, or anything else of oh, no. There were photographs of some of the elite gymnasts. Um, I don't know that they were in the exam rooms, but I saw them in the hallways and in the um, waiting lobby. Were any of the photographs with those elite gymnasts and Dr. Nassar together? At least one of them was. Do you remember who the gymnast was? I don't. Okay. Um, so you're in the exam room, your mother is with you. Tell us what you're wearing when this evaluation is taking place. Um, I was asked to come in loose clothing. Um, loose, flexible clothing, so I was wearing a pair of shorts and a loose top, like a t-shirt kind of material. Um, and how is the evaluation, how does, it, how does it happen? What does he do, if you can summarize it for us? Mm -hmm. um, he checked, um, checked a lot of things. He checked the flexibility of various muscle groups, checked the mobility of my joints, um, checked my hip alignment. Uh, he found that one of my hips was aligned, um, which wasn't a surprise. I had some scoliosis, which we already knew about um, coming into the exam. I just did a pretty thorough evaluation. These are all kind of done through what your range of motion is, various different techniques that he uses to evaluate that mm -hmm. stuff there. Yes. Um, so you
hip alignment and with the back pain. Were you familiar with osteopathic manipulative medicine prior to his reduction of that at this appointment? I was to a point um, because there was a pediatrician in the local office that was also an osteopath and he had adjusted my ribs by a visit um, prior to seeing Dr. Nasser. So I was aware of that classification of medicine. And in your prior experience, um, what did you understand that type of treatment to, to be? Um, the way it had been explained to me from other sources was that the osteopaths um, worked a little more naturally with your body um, and had alternative techniques and alternative treatments um, to a normal uh, normal medical doctor. Were they more hands-on than perhaps an uh, MD? Yes. Did Dr. Nasser, when he made this recommendation of osteopathic manipulative medicine, did he describe um, specifically what that would be to you or your mother? No, he just said it would be myofascial release. Okay. So um, did you understand what myofascial release was at that time? Yes, I understood that it was a release of the muscle fibers and, and specifically the sheath coating the muscle. Okay. Did you understand um, how that myofascial release is accomplished or done? I hadn't had a lot of experience with it up to that point, no. So I knew it was massage type techniques. Did Dr. Nasser um, describe for you how he would do the myofascial release on that particular day? No, he did not. Um, did you and your mother agree to um, allow for the myofascial release for the osteopathic manipulative um, massage at that day? Yes. Okay. Did you have any hesitation about agreeing to that, those procedures? No. Why not? Well, because I knew it was a, a common classification medicine, um, and I mean, he was the only team physician. That's why I was there. It was because he could do things that the doctors couldn't. Did you trust him? I did. Um, did you believe that the treatment that he could do for you would help relieve your um, your pain or your injuries? Yes. And um, I want to make sure we understand. we're talking about the same person. Can you just can you point to the person you know as Dr. Nasser and describe for me what he's wearing? He is wearing a striped suit. I guess that the record reflect she has planned to identify the defendant. No objection, Judge. The record will so be fine. When um, he started his treatment of you that day, was your mother still in the room? Yes, she was. Was there any other personnel in shop? There was not. Okay, so it was you, Dr. Nasser, and your mother. What's your mom's name? Camille. Um, Tell me, did he guide you through how um, you were to be placed or stand or where your body is? He asked me to stand for the first treatment and my legs a little bit apart. Okay. Did you do that? I did. And what were you wearing on your body at that time? I was wearing uh, these athletic shorts and then like a t-shirt. Okay. Tell me what um, the next thing that happened. You're standing up. He's getting ready to do this treatment. What is he doing? <coughs> um, he knelt down beside me and said he was going to adjust my hips. Um, Tell me what the next thing he did was. Um, he put one hand on the exterior of my pelvis, and with his other hand, he went interior into my shorts and used two fingers to penetrate me vaginally. Um, and then he pulled on the hip bone and pressed with the other hand that was exterior. Okay, you gave me a lot of information, so I want to go back just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, you're standing up. Tell me how his body is in relationship to you standing. He was kneeling a little bit behind me, to a little to the side. Right. Where is your mom in relationship to your <coughs> She was in front. And um, you said that one hand was on your pelvic, pelvis? <coughs> yes. Yeah, near your hip? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And the other hand, um, please tell me again what, where, where that went or was. He went up my shorts and inside my underwear and used two fingers to penetrate me vaginally. So you were wearing underneath, underwear underneath your shorts, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And um, did he have any gloves on his hand? He did not. Did he give you any warning that he would be putting his fingers inside of your shorts, inside of your underwear, into your vagina? He did not. What was your reaction? I wasn't sure what to think. Um, I had a classification for needing to do internal manipulative work. There was a friend of my mother's who had had some birth injuries, and she had told me um, when I was seeking treatment from the doctors in Kalamazoo that she was seeing a physical therapist in Kalamazoo, um, and she told me there, you know, there are these new techniques and that sometimes the muscles had to be accessed vaginally or rectally, 
and she had suggested to my mom that she take me to this physical therapist in Kalamazoo if I could not get relief from the sports medicine doctors in Kalamazoo. Um, and we opted at that time to go ahead and go to Dr. Nasser because he specialized in gymnastics. Um, but we had, had a discussion. You know, there might be some uncomfortable things that need to be done. Um, now I had no indication that Dr. Nasser practiced intravaginal manipulative work, but because I knew that was a classification and I had been told he does all of these new techniques, um, my presumption was that he must be doing intravaginal work. This must be whatever it is that I've heard about. As it was happening? Correct. Okay, let's go back just a little bit too. Um, you said that you had a classification of um, intravaginal work. Is that mm-hmm. something that you had been diagnosed or told that you needed at 15? No. Okay, so you were... Were you aware that this was um, a technique that some adult women may encounter? Yes, I had heard about it because of a, a friend who needed it for birth injuries. Okay. So you had um, a family friend who had experienced this type of treatment mm-hmm. and who was an adult, is correct. that correct? Yes. Who was not treated by Dr. Nelson. Correct. Who was treated by a physical therapist who was trained and specialized in this technique? Yes. And it was at least on your radar. Correct, right? exactly. Right. Okay. Um, and her specific injury was related to um, childbirth. Childbirth. Mm-hmm. Okay. You hadn't given birth. No. Protein, right? No, I had not. So this is a technique that you were aware of, mm-hmm. correct? Okay. And at the time that Dr. Nasser penetrated your vagina, your thought went to that technique, technique that you were aware of. Yeah. <coughs> The best I could figure was it had to be legitimate. He couldn't be the national team physician. He couldn't be teaching osteopathic medicine. He couldn't be this revered physician if he wasn't doing legitimate medicine. Was there any hesitation on his part when he did that movement, when he penetrated you? Not at all. It was something he did regularly. It was clear. Prior to that act, did he ever describe to you or your mother that he would be doing any type of intervaginal work? No, he did not. Did he ever describe for you specifically where his fingers or his hands would be touching you? No, he did not. Did you or your mother ever give him consent to um, penetrate your vagina? No, he did not. Was he wearing a glove? He was not wearing a glove. Was his bare skin touching your bare skin in your vagina? Yes, that is correct. Did he use any type of lubricant before um, his finger entered your vagina? It was two fingers, so no, he did not. Um, Rachel, at 15, would you describe yourself as um, knowledgeable or experienced with that area of your body, your genital or private area? From an anatomy perspective, yes. Um, from a sexual perspective, no. I had not experimented sexually at that point. Um, was it on your radar at all that this could be some type of sexual act by a doctor? No, it was not. Can you tell me if at this point you had begun menstruating yet? Yes, I had. Um, and had you ever used a tampon when you were menstruating? Yes. And we're, is there any hesitation at all in your memory, that there was entry into your vagina by his fingers? Absolutely not. Tell me how long it lasted, if you remember. That particular was maybe 30 seconds. Did he say anything to you while he was doing that? He did not. Um, Did you say anything to him? No. Do you know if your mother could see exactly where his hand was at? She could not. My shorts were in the thigh leg, and his hand was um, far enough inside that she could not see. Rachel, at some point, did you obtain um, copies of your medical records for all of your appointments with Dr. Nasser? Yes, I did. And was that around 2003? <coughs> it was. Have you had a chance to review those records? Yes, I reviewed them many, many times since then. Okay. We'll get into that in just a minute, but did you review the records that relate to this first appointment in February 2000? Yes. Within those records, is there any mention, either in his own handwriting, either in his own treatment plan, um, that he performed any type of intervaginal penetration or treatment? No, there is not. Is there any mention that you were ever informed or 
gave consent for any type of intervaginal treatment. No, there is not. Was there any other type of um, treatment done that day? Yes, he also um, suggested that he could do sports massage and additional osteopathic manual manipulation. And did he do that? He did. Tell me when you left that appointment, what did you think about it? I thought he had found things that other doctors hadn't found. I had hoped for the first time that I could heal and be able to compete again. I thought he was very caring, very gregarious. He made you feel like he was going to take care of you. And as it relates to that penetration, you thought that that was something that was um, legitimate? I thought this must be this intervaginal technique that I've heard about. It must be. Must be. Did there come a point in that same month, in February 2000, that you came back um, for treatment with Dr. Nassau? Yes. Um, was that kind of a follow-up appointment um, with him? Mm -hmm. And was it done in a similar manner as that first appointment? Yes, there was additional penetration in that first appointment as well. Okay. Um, and in the remaining five, that there was, uh, it would, in conjunction with the osteopathic manual manipulation and massage that took place on the massage table. Okay, I want to make sure I understand exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. When I speak of the first appointment, um, I'm talking about that very first time that you ever saw him, right? Yes. The act that you just described for us where he had those baby athletic shorts and his hand went up into those shorts. Mm -hmm. Besides that act of penetration, did anything else occur um, involving penetration that first day? Yes, I did. Okay, describe for me that. He decided, he suggested that he could do sports massage um, on the gluteal muscles and on my uh, lower back muscles. So he asked me to lay down on the massage table and then with one hand, he did legitimate massage techniques on the lower back and on the hip region. But with his other hand, he went internally, vaginally, and continued to massage vaginally um, with both fingers penetrating for the, for the duration of the treatment. All right, let's go back just a little bit. Can you describe for me how your body was placed um, when the massage began? Mm -hmm. I was laying face down on the table with my head near the chair where my mother was sitting. Did you still have on those baby shorts and underwear? Yes, I did. And, um, you described, I think what you said was a legitimate massage. Describe for me what he was doing that you believe was a legitimate massage. With his external hand, his right hand, he was using the heel of his hand and his forearm um, to do deep tissue massage and some light, um, some light pressure intermittently to release the fascia exteriorly. And where exactly in your body was he doing that technique? Um, on my hips and gluteal muscles and my lower back, but it would extend up to the upper back at times. Would your um, t-shirt and your shorts remain um, on your body when he was doing that, between his, his body and work? He would pull the shirt up a little bit and pull the shorts down a little bit to access the muscles exteriorly. Okay, so just the distinct contact while he was doing this. Correct. And you said as he was doing that with one hand, another hand was somewhere else on your body. That's correct. Okay, and, and specifically, Describe for me how this hand came to be in that other area of your body. He went underneath my shorts and underwear and used two fingers to penetrate me vaginally. Describe for me, if you can, what his fingers were doing when they were penetrating you. Mm -hmm. He would thrust in and then sweep downwards and pull out and do this repetitively and rhythmically okay. for the duration of the massage. You said he would thrust in and sweep downward mm -hmm. with the two fingers. Correct. Okay. Describe for me how that felt. Um, it felt very uncomfortable, very humiliating, and very degrading. Why but did it feel like that? Because it was so intimate. Because he was where no one was supposed to be. But my presumption was this is what I needed to do to get better. I even put it in that classification. This, this must be this intervaginal technique that I've heard about. And I thought this is, this is why I'm here. I'm here to get better. I'm here because he can do things that other doctors can't do. And I had known um, that, that there are times medically, you know, outside of this particular visit, just in the context of medical, there are things you have to do medically sometimes to get better, and I thought this was one of them. As a gymnast, were there times where you had to push past pain or discomfort? Oh, all the time. 
were there times that your personal space might be invaded more than, say, another sport? Mm -hmm. Gymnastics is a very physically driven sport. Um, it's very contact heavy. You rely on your coaches to keep you safe, and the way that they keep you safe as you're training is by having hands on contact with you as they you know, position your body for certain skills and maneuver. Um, a lot of stretching, a lot of um, muscle work. Um, so it's, it's very contact heavy. You have to get used to physical contact and you have to trust the person that's touching you because your safety is dependent on it. Including contact with your butt or your hips yes. or your pelvis area. Yes. Um, do you know how long that particular act of penetration occurred for? Anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes. It was the duration of the massage. Describe for me if you can where your mom was when this was happening. She was sitting in a chair that was near the table, and Dr. Nasser was positioned between her and I. Could she see if you know your shorts? No, she could not. Was there any particular reason you did not get her attention, did not ask him to stop what he was doing? Because I presumed it was legitimate. This had to be that technique I had heard about, and the idea that someone would sexually assault a child while their mother was in the room wasn't a classification that I had. It, wasn't, it was not possible. And because it was so brazen, I did not think, it, it was clear to me that he had done this regularly. It was clear to me this was a normal method of treatment. There was no pause, no hesitation. His movements were very practiced, very rehearsed. And if that was the case, then this was something he did on a regular basis. If this was something he did on a regular basis, it could not be sexual assault because he wouldn't be allowed to do it. That's what you were thinking of. Yes, somebody would have caught him. Did you feel as though you were in a position to object or stop? I didn't. He was the medical expert. He knew things that I didn't know. Did you consider him to, to be an authority figure? Absolutely. Why? He was He was the one in charge of telling your coaches what I could and couldn't do. He had medical expertise I didn't have. That's why I had to see a doctor, because I couldn't fix myself. Tell me, um, at the time that he was doing that penetration you just described, did he have any gloves on? He did not. Did he use any type of lubricant? Yes, he used a massage cream. He would scoop it out with a tongue depressor, and then he would put it in various places and scoop some of his fingers off of usually my inner thigh. So you would use a massage cream as a sort of vaginal lubricant? Yes. Um, Anywhere in those medical records that you reviewed for, again, this first appointment, is there a mention of what you just described to us? There is not. Did there come a point after the first appointment that you came back to him? Yes. And why was that? Um, I was supposed to come back for follow-up treatments to evaluate the progress of the physical therapy. Did you have any apprehension or concern about what might happen at this second appointment? I hoped that it wouldn't be necessary again. But I trusted that if it was, if we did have to do internal work again, that, that's what I had to do. Um, when you went back to see him, did he check that range of motion, motion mm -hmm. do that same similar evaluation? Yes. Okay. And was that later in the same month? 2000, 2000. I believe so. Okay. Yes. Um, did he make a determination about what treatment to seek on the second visit and that he would do on the second visit? Just that we would continue doing osteopathic manual manipulation. Somewhere in that time frame, I did start physical therapy as a maintenance at home, but I couldn't tell you for sure when it was the second visit. So at some point at the same time that you're seeing Dr. Nasser, you also um, went to a physical therapist? That's correct. And did the physical therapist ever do um, massage or osteopathic manipulations to you? She did external myofascial release in the same areas with my, my glutes and my back. Um, did that physical therapist ever penetrate your vagina during she, those treatments? She did not. Um, during the second appointment, um, did there come a point that the massage started? Yes. And describe for me if you can again where your body was placed. Same type of situation. I was laying face down on the massage table with my mom sitting uh, up near my head and Dr. Nasser positioned in between us. Describe for me what you have on your body during this second appointment. Same clothing, um, light loose weight, that weight, athletic shorts and a t-shirt, underwear, bra. And describe for me how the massage goes. Um, same situation. He began using his right hand externally and right forearm to do legitimate massage techniques. 
and he immediately began penetrating, massaging vaginally as well. Uh, did he explain to you that he would be doing um, any type of intervaginal massage prior to doing that at this appointment? He did not. Did he get the consent from you or your mother to do that type of treatment? He did not. Did he wear gloves before he penetrated you? He did not. Did he use any type of lubricant? Yes, he used the massage cream. Yes. Okay. And can you describe for me what exactly these fingers were doing when they were penetrating? Mm -hmm. He would thrust inward and then sweep downward and pull up and do this repetitively. Um, was this a quick motion? Um, no, not very. Was it a gentle motion? No. Describe for, for me how you would describe it. We go like this. In and out. In and out. For the record, she has used her left hand. Do you know if it was your left hand or not? It was his left. It was his left hand. She has her, her pointer finger and her middle finger together. That's correct. And the record shows that she's sweeping upward and downward mm -hmm. and then in, down, and out. In, down, down and out. out. Is that accurate? So mm -hmm. any objection to that characterization, Ms. Oh, uh, no, Your Honor. And the record will still be fine. What was he doing while he would do that, Mr. Um, sometimes he would talk to my mom. He would use his right hand to do external massage on my back and on my hips. Um, sometimes he would talk to me. He would whisper and he would say, does this hurt you, Rach? Am I hurting you, Rach? And where would he whisper that? Near my ear. What would you say to no. him? Was it hurting you? Sometimes. Why would you say that? Because the last thing I wanted to do is draw more attention. During this appointment, um, do you have any idea how long that occurred? Between 20 and 30 minutes. Was that the only type of, um, of inappropriate touching at that time? No. Tell me what happened next. Um, within that second visit, there were times that his fingers would come out and he would um, briefly massage the external genitalia as well. With his fingers? With his fingers. And describe for me, if you can, exactly where on your body he was massaging when he would remove his fingers from your vagina. He would massage the clitoris. And um, would, did that happen once or more than once? Explain for me kind of the sequence. It happened two times within that visit. He was penetrating your vagina, he removed his fingers, he rubbed your clitoris, mm -hmm. and then he would penetrate again? Yes, that's correct. What was your reaction to that type of touch? I thought his hand had to have slipped. That was the only explanation I could come up with. Was it a quick touch? He would go around three or four times. Did he say anything to you at that point? Not a thing. Before doing that, did he tell you he would be touching that area of your body? No. Did anything else occur at that second appointment? He also used his thumb to penetrate rectally at that second appointment. And this did not happen at the first appointment? It did not. Was it the same hand or a different hand that was penetrating your vagina? Same. Was it at the same time or a different time that the vaginal penetration was occurring? Same time. Describe for me if you can what that was, how that looked. He would use his thumb to thrust in and out rectally. At the same time that he, his fingers were penetrating your vagina? That's correct. What was your reaction to, to that touching? I thought it was disgusting. Was there any warning given before he penetrated your, um, your anal you know, opening your back? No. Um, did he ever explain to you that this was a treatment that he needed to do that day? No. Had you ever been diagnosed with any kind of tailbone or coxis, coxic um, injury by Dr. Manser? Not to my recollection, no. Um, did he have a blood on when he was? He did not. Did he use any of the massage cream as a lubricant for his thumb? Yes, he did. Do you know how long his thumb was in your reaction? I don't. How many were between five and ten minutes? It was not the continual. Was there any reason that you didn't ask him to stop? I thought it was what I had to do. Again, I had that classification. I had a friend's mom who told me, this is, this is how my tailbone, this is how my hips, this is how my back got fixed. 
and my presumption was this must be the technique that he's doing. I'm here because he does things no other doctors can do. Let's speak specifically about the anal penetration. Were you aware that that was something that doctors might do for particular injuries? Yes. Okay. And was that something that your family friend would share? Is this the same family friend that had the inter? Oh, yes. Yes, she had also had some of that had to be accessed interactively for her as well. Um, When he finished that touching, what did he do? Um, he washed his hands when he finished the exam, gave me instructions for what I could and couldn't do in the gym, and planned to come back in a couple of weeks. Did you review the medical records that Dr. Nasser prepared relating to this second appointment? Many times. Is there any mention of any type of treatment that involved intervaginal penetration? There is no. Is there any mention of any type of treatment that included inter um, anal or rectal penetration? There is one. Is there any mention of massage or rubbing of the clitoris? There is not. Did there come a point where you uh, saw him again um, during March of 2000? Yes. Okay. And uh, were you still having back and wrist? Injuries, those injuries that brought you to him in the first place. Yes. Okay. At that next appointment, was it similar to the prior two that you had? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, and did you have two appointments in March of 2000? I believe so, yes. Okay. And are you able in your, I guess, mind to differentiate those two appointments at all? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about the first March appointment. Can you tell me, um, did he do... A evaluation of you as well, mm -hmm. similar to what he'd done before. Yeah, he always checked my hip alignment and checked how the muscles were firing, shoulder flexibility, uh, abdominal core strength. Did the appointments kind of um, run in a similar manner? Yes. For instance, you would come in, talk about any complaints that you had. There'd be an evaluation. They talk about treatment, and then the treatment would take place. Is that fair to summarize yes. it? Yeah, okay. that's correct. Um, what was the treatment that was proposed again at this appointment? I was still there for osteopathic manual manipulation. Okay. So that type of um, massage and or myofascial release mm -hmm. as well? Yes. And did that occur? Yes, it did. And was your mother in the room again? She was. Describe for me if you can, um, on this occasion, where uh, your body was. Mm -hmm. Face down on the massage table, my mother sitting near the head, and the doctor was her positioned between us. Okay. And what were you wearing? Loose athletic shorts and a t-shirt. Similar or the same thing that you wore before? Yeah. Okay. With underwear underneath the shorts? Right? Yes. Um, tell me what he did during this occasion, this appointment. Um, this appointment, he removed my shorts and underwear completely and put them um, at the base of the table while he did the massage and covered me with a towel. Um, but he covered me with a towel first before removing the shorts and underwear, so my mom did not know that he had done that, and I did not know that she did not know. So you were laying on the table, at some point you have shorts and underwear on, mm -hmm. and then he covers you with um, something? Yes, with a towel. With a towel, okay. What type of towel? Just like a like a bath towel, like you use at a swimming pool. Okay. And um, you said that he removed your shorts and your underwear? Yes, he did. Okay. What did you think about that? I thought it was odd, because he hadn't done it before. But again, he's here because he's the expert. That's why I'm here. Okay. Um, did you feel as though you could object or stop him from doing that? No. Why not? I thought it was what had to be done. I mean, if he said it needed to be done, it needed to be done. I was here because other doctors hadn't been able to help. So at the point that he removed your shorts and your underwear, um, besides the towel, was there anything covering the lower half of your body from your waist down? I had socks on, but other than that. Um, tell me what the next thing that happened was. He began to do a sports massage, again, with his right hand externally, and then went underneath the towel to do the vaginal penetration. Was this the similar or the same type of touch that he'd done on those prior two occasions? Yes, it was. Okay. Again, was there any um, warning before he put his finger into your vagina? No, it was not. It was fingers. Oh, fingers. 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 Correction. Okay. Um, do you know how many fingers? Two. Okay. And how are you confident that you know it was the two fingers? I could feel both of them. Um, it was also more than a tampon, um, which was the only thing I had accommodated at that point. 
And then I could feel the other two fingers bent inwards when he would rest, and I could feel the exterior of the knuckles against the outer labia. Um, was it the same type of touching that you described before, before about sweeping and thrusting? Yes. Um, did he wear any gloves? He did not. What was he doing during this penetration? Uh, sometimes he would talk to me, sometimes he would talk to mom, sometimes we would just be silent. Do you have an estimate for how long this occurred? 20 to 30 minutes. Was there ever any other type of um, inappropriate touching at this appointment in the There was not at this point. Um, did there come a point where it ended? The massage? Yes. yes. And then what did he do? Um, he had me sit up and then he wrapped the towel around me and washed his hands and left the room so that I could redress. And then did you get dressed? Yes, I did. And was your mother still in the room when you got dressed? Yes. Did you become aware <laughs> of whether or not your mom realized you did not have any underwear or shorts on? She made a comment that, oh, I didn't know he had taken those off. But because he was massaging um, the external um, glute muscles, she presumed that that must be why they had to be removed. Was there um, a second visit in March? This would be your fourth visit with Dr. Manso. Yes. Okay. Um, did anything um, similar to what had occurred before happen at this fourth appointment? Yes, the same type of treatment. The same type of treatment. Okay. Um, can you describe for me again how your body was during that treatment? Mm -hmm. I was face down on the massage table. No one was sitting near the head. He was positioned between her and I. Um, and what were you wearing on your body at that point? There's athletic shorts, underwear, t shirt, and bra. And socks. Um, did anything happen with your shorts or your underwear during this appointment? Uh, he lowered them at this appointment, but he did not remove them. And when you say lowered them, how is the lowered them? Uh, about halfway down. The glute muscle, halfway down the butt cheek. Um, was it still covering, like, the back of your, where your, where your legs and your butt would be? Yes. Okay. Um, did he use any type of towel to cover any area of the body at this I think he tucked one into the top of the shorts because of the massage cream. And tell me what he did during this appointment. Um, he used his right hand externally and forearm to do um, massage on the back of the glutes. And then he used his left hand and two fingers to penetrate vaginally. Was it the same type of motion or a different type of motion from what you described from the prior three appointments? It was the same that thrusting and sweeping? That's correct. Um, did he touch you anywhere else on this fourth appointment? Yes, the fourth appointment he had external genitalia contact as well. Describe for me. I'm sorry, I'm, I missed what it is that you said. I said the fourth appointment he had external genitalia contact as well. Can you be more specific and tell me exactly where he touched you externally? He would use two fingers to come down and massage the clitoral area three to four times. And um, was this similar to what you described before, where his hands would penetrate your vagina, they exit the vagina, they um, rub or touch the clitoris, and then they would then penetrate again? Yes. Um, was he saying anything to you during this time? Yeah. Well, he would, he would occasionally ask again if it was hurting, but outside of that, no. Would he do it in that whisper in your ear? Yes. He would whisper. How did that make you feel? I felt like it was a very intimate question to be asking. Again, was there any warning that he would be either penetrating the vagina or touching your clitoris? No. During this appointment, can you tell us how long that touching lasted? Between 20 and 30 minutes. And um, at some point it ended? Yes, he did do anal penetration at that appointment as well. Okay. Um, tell me more about that, please. He would use his thumb to penetrate anally to breast in and out while he was penetrating vaginally. So these three acts would all occur kind of intermixed with each other. Is, yes. that, is that fair to say? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Where he would put his thumb in your anus um, while his fingers were in your vagina, then he would touch your clitoris and then go back to that. That's correct. And your mother was in the room during this appointment as well? She was. Okay. Um, were you aware whether she could see where his hand was placed? 
I presumed that she could see what was happening. I did not find out until much later that she could not. Uh, why did you presume that? Uh, because I, I thought if there was something wrong, she would speak up. Can you describe for me where his body was placed in relationship to your body and your mother? Mm -hmm. He was standing kind of around the waist area, so in between uh, mom and I. His body was in between you and your mom? Correct. Okay. In between your waist area? Yes. Um, when he finished this massage, did you wash his hands again? He did. And you didn't have any gloves on, right? He did not have gloves on. And you reviewed the records for this appointment? I uh have. -huh. Is there any mention in the records of um, doing either the intervaginal <coughs> treatment, the interanal treatment, or the touching of the body of the people? There is not. And you did not give consent, or are you aware of your mother giving consent for any of those procedures? I did not give consent, and my mother did not give consent. Did there come a time, Rachel, that you came to see him um, on a fifth visit, somewhere around April 18th of 2000? Mm -hmm. So yes. Yes. And um, was that, that was the fifth visit, right? There was yes. nothing in between. Yes, that was the fifth visit. Did it... Did that visit also at least begin similar to the other visits mm -hmm. that you had? Yes. Was there an evaluation? Yes. Was there a discussion of your injuries or your pain mm -hmm. and a discussion of the treatment whenever what would come next? Yes. Let me ask you this. In the two months that you were seeing him, were you getting any relief for your wrist or back injuries? Um, the wrist we weren't focusing on so much at that point. So I was he had shown me some techniques for TV and provided some minimal support. Um, and the back was getting better with exercise and core strength being used. And you were still seeing a physical therapist locally as well? I think I was at that time. I haven't reviewed those records to see where the dates lined up. But yes, the visits intermingled. And the focus was on this back injury, right? Yes. Um, did there come a point where he also did the osteopathic manipulative massage and the myofascial release on the Yes, there was. Describe for me again, if you can, how your body began during this appointment. Mm -hmm. I was laying face down on the table, um, and my mom was sitting at the head of the table, and he was positioned in between her and I. Describe for me what you're wearing on this appointment, please. Loose athletic shorts and a t-shirt, bra, and underwear. Um, what's the next thing that happened? He began doing external massage and then began penetrating vaginally with two fingers. Very similar to the four other appointments that you've had? Yes. Um, and again, how was it that his hands were able to penetrate your vagina if you were in shorts? He would go up inside the shorts and up inside the underwear. Up inside through the leg of your shorts? Yes. Okay. Um, was he wearing any gloves during this appointment? He was not. Did he give you any warning that he would be penetrating your vagina? He did not. Did you or your mother give him consent <coughs> to perform that particular um, act? He did not. Um, Describe for me if you can specifically what his fingers were doing during during that penetration. Mm -hmm. Same so motion as before. He used two fingers to press in words, you down and pull out. And how long did that um, last for? Between fifteen and twenty minutes. Did he um, do any of the other acts you described for us during this particular appointment? Are there any other acts? Yes. Um, yes, at the end, he um, came around to the other side of the massage table, and he had me roll um, onto my hip. So I was laying on my right side. Um, and he started to, with, with his right hand, he was massaging externally, um, but he began coming up um, closer and closer um, up my body, and then he had, he had unhooked my bra before he rolled me over, and then he put his hand up my shirt and massaged my left breast. You gave me a lot of information, so I want to go back a little bit. Let's talk before your body position changes. Um, did he, you, you told us that he penetrated your, your vagina. Mm -hmm. Did he penetrate um, your anus or your rectum at all at that time? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, did he ever touch your external genitalia while you're still in that prone or on your stomach position? I don't remember for that visit. Okay. Um, so at some point you told us that he came around and he moved your body. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yes. yes. Okay. And describe for me if you can exactly how your body was placed after it was moved. Mm -hmm. I was laying on my side with um, one arm up, um, tucked in, 
So I was laying kind of like this on my side, um, but with legs straight. And just for the record, you put like your, your hands up towards your face, mm -hmm. your elbows and to your body, yes. and bent. Yes. Um, is that fair? That's fair. And you were rolled onto your side, is that correct? So one hip would be toward the ceiling, one hip would be toward the floor. Yes. Okay. Just try for me if you can um, where you were facing toward. I was facing towards the wall away from my mom. Okay. Your mom was behind you? Correct. Okay. And where was Dr. Nasser um, in relationship to you and your mom? Um, he was on the other side of the table. He was on the side closest to your mom? No, he was on the side um, closest to the wall when he rolled me. He came around to the other side, but he was between I and the wall. I was facing towards him. Okay. Um, after he rotated you around, tell me what he did next. Um, well, he, he had unhooked my bra before he did that. Um, and then he came around, and he was um, doing external massage with his right hand um, on my back. And then he began to massage higher and walking up, you know, walking up higher to get closer. And then he moved this arm upwards and put his hand up my shirt and under my bra and massaged my left breast. Is that from the front of your um, shirt? Yes. Okay. And he, your back was to your mother, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Um, do you remember at what point he had um, unhooked your bra? Shortly before we went over. Okay. Did he describe for you why he was doing that? He did not. What was your reaction to him unhooking your bra? I wasn't sure what to make of it. And you described for me um, when he unhooked the brow and you had been on your side that his hand came up your um, shirt mm -hmm. and he was touching your body. Exactly where was his hand touching your body? He put his palm on my breast and cupped it and then squeezed and massaged in a circular motion. Your breast? Yes. And Back. was it his bare, his bare skin? Yes, it was. Right. Did he tell you anything while he was doing that? He did not. What was your reaction? I froze. Why did you freeze? Because I knew that was sexual assault. Did you think at any point that there was any kind of legitimate treatment going on? No, absolutely not. At the same time that he's touching your breast, is he touching anywhere else on your body? Yes, he's still massaging externally on my shoulder blade area with his right hand. Um, and how is his right hand on your shoulder blade? He's got his hand ever over my back. So his right hand is on your shoulder blade, his left hand is still cupping and massaging his breath? Yes. And um, how long does that last for? A minute or two, perhaps. Was there any particular reason that you um, didn't say anything to him? I froze. I couldn't. Was there any reason that you didn't bring it to your mother's attention what was happening? I was very confused. I didn't know how to reconcile who he was supposed to be with what he had done. And I didn't want to give it once or to make it real. Tell me what the next thing that happened was. Um, when he finished, he rolled me back over and I hoped my bra and the appointment ended. I want to go back just a little bit. Um, Did there come a point, um, you, I think you described for us that he was um, penetrating you vaginally, correct? Mm -hmm. And you said it was that thrusting yes. sweeping motion, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, did you notice anything unusual about his behavior during this appointment? Yes, when he rolled me to my side and came around the table, he had a very visible erection, and his face was flushed and he was breathing heavily. Describe for me specifically what you could see. I could see his erection in his pants very clearly. I said, go ahead. His cheeks were flushed, his eyes were closed, and he was breathing heavily. What is going on at the point where his um, cheeks are flushed and his eyes are closed? What is he doing? He's working his way up to my, uh, through my shirt. With his hands? Yes. To touch your breasts? Yes. Does he, do you notice whether his eyes are being closed while he's touching your breasts? I do not look. What did you do? I closed my eyes. I looked down. What did you think about this appointment? It made me feel physically ill. I thought I was going to throw it. At some point, it ended? Mm -hmm. What did he do? He rehooked my bra and then he uh, finished the appointment. 
prior to that touching of your breast, did he ever indicate to you that you had any kind of rib issues, any kind of injury related to the rib area of your body? No, and he was not touching the rib area. Um, in reviewing your medical records, did you identify this particular point in the records associated with it? Yes. Did you notice in those records whether there was any mention of um, the vaginal penetration? There was not. Any mention of the cupping of your breasts? There was not. Any mention of the removal of your bra? No. Any mention of his erection? No. Did you mention at all to your mom after that appointment what he did? No, I did not. Is there any reason that you didn't? I was confused. I didn't know what to do with it. And more than anything, I wanted it to go away. I didn't want to have to think about it. I didn't want to have to process it. And I didn't want to draw extra attention to it. And having to verbalize makes it real. And just so, just so we're clear, um, I know we talked about the first appointment that was just you and him and your mother in the room. Mm -hmm. um, so yes? Yes. Okay. At those four subsequent appointments that you testified about today, was there ever any other chaperone besides your mother in the room? Sometimes there would be a medical student who he would bring in when he was doing the evaluation, but he always left before the treatment. Why did they leave? Well, I presume because of the type of treatment. Were, were they ever told or ordered to leave if you remember? Yes, he would ask them to leave, let them know that they could go. The defendant would ask them to leave? Yes, very nice. Rachel, did, did you ever go back to see him after that April 18, 2000 appointment? I did actually. I broke my foot just a few days later, and so he oversaw the rehabilitation for my foot injury. Did you ever receive that osteopathic manipulative um, massage or malpractice <coughs> again for your treatments with him? No, I told him my back was better so that I wouldn't have to. Was your back truly better? No. Why did you tell him that? Because he had sexually assaulted me and I knew it. Did anything else inappropriate happen at any of those subsequent times that you um, visited him? Not anything overtly inappropriate. There were behaviors that I would classify as grooming behaviors. What did you mean by that? He paid particular attention to my shoes. I had a pair of ankle boots that he really liked, and he would comment on them um, whenever I wore them, just how cute those shoes were and how much he liked them. Um, there was a time shortly thereafter in June that I saw him. On the last visit, when I was allowed to take the, uh, the walking boot off that I had, um, I had I had been up here at Lansing for a uh, I was up at Lansing for a camp a worldview camp and I was wearing makeup that day because it was a debate camp um, and he commented on how beautiful I looked how much I was growing up uh, so there were, there were things like that that would happen but I did not allow him to treat my back again. How did it make you feel when he would make those comments? <laughs> I wasn't really sure what to make of him to be honest <laughs> because he was. This person who was supposed to be taking care of me, who I was supposed to trust, who I was still trying to figure out um, who he really was and what had happened. Did there come a point on, well, let me ask you this in a different manner. Were you able to put those students out of your head? No. Why not? Because I had been sexually assaulted and I knew it. Because my trust had been used against me like a weapon. And I never wanted to trust again. Describe for me what you did after that appointment um, as it relates to trying to figure it all out. Um, I began, eventually, I began researching international massage techniques. I began to question some of the other things that had made me feel so embarrassed and so humiliated. I began to question whether there was um, more that was not legitimate that I had not recognized. Um, so I, can, I began to, to research. Um, we also talked to uh, the two physical therapists that were overseeing um, my back injuries. Um, one of them, the, the particular practice at the end, one of them was at that point trained in pelvic floor work. Um, and so I asked my mom to talk to, to, talk to both of them uh, just to kind of give them an idea of what had happened and to get their input on it. 
And this was this was probably at least a year afterwards, though. Let me ask you this very specifically: Did Dr. Nashler ever diagnose you with any type of pelvic floor injury? No. Um, that wasn't what you were there to see him for. Correct. Correct. Um, did there come a point where you told your mom? about what had happened when she was in the room with you. I told her some things. I did not tell her all of them. Do you remember when the first time you broached the subject was? I really don't remember the date. There was a time period where she found out that he was doing work intervaginally. Um, and both of us, I believe it was because um, I was on my period at one point, and we had potentially been going to have an appointment with him. Um, and I said, yeah, I can't have this appointment because it, you, know, you won't be able to treat me. So we had a discussion at that point, um, and our discussion was, well, we know that in terms of intervaginal work can be a legitimate form of treatment. This must be what he's doing. And that was the conclusion at that time that both my mother and I came to, is this must be this form of intervaginal treatment that we've heard about. That, that must be what he's doing. And this is during that February to um, April 2000 time period. It was sometime in the yeah late spring, early summer. I really don't know that it was before the fifth visit. It was sometime around that time frame. Okay. Um, but it was before the fifth visit. I can't say for sure that it was before the visit. No. It was during the time that you were still seeing. Yes. Okay. That you made some reference to being on your period and having some concerns because of that mm -hmm. in his treatment. Correct. And your mother um, also believed that you did that this was some type of legitimate internal mm -hmm. public work. Mm -hmm. Um, were you and she concerned at all about the idea that he didn't describe for you what he was going to be doing before him? We were, um, and we were we were concerned about the fact that he hadn't used gloves. But again, all we could fall back on was he was the national team physician. He was this revered doctor that MSU held out. It was clearly something he did very regularly. Again, his movements were very rehearsed. They were very confident. I was not a test case. And our presumption was that if, if he was not doing something legitimate, somebody would have stopped him. Did there come a point where you told your mother more about, about the business? Sometime around a year later, I finally disclosed to her um, about the breast massage and what he had done on the fifth visit. Did there also come a point where you told her that he had been touching your clitoris and doing the external massage? Not till around 2003. Um, as a result of that, did you and your mother um, reach out to those physical therapists that you mentioned? Yes. And what was the reason for, for bringing this subject up to them? We just wanted to confirm that it was legitimate treatment. We were beginning to have questions about what he was doing. And did they give you some information? They did. Did it help you decide whether or not you believe this was legitimate or not? It, yes, it helped. Um, I'll clarify that our intent were very valid and legitimate. At that point, was there any particular reason that you didn't report what Dr. Nasser um, had done? Once you have this information that you didn't report it, is it accurate that you did not report it to anybody official? Not in 2000, 2001. Or after speaking with those physical therapists and affirming the concerns? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I think I must have missed the, the, the year that that conversation took place. My last note was that you told your mom in 2003 about what happened with regard to the massage of the breast. Was that the same year? It was around 2001 that I told her about the massage of the breast. And what year was it that you went to the, the therapist? Sometimes, I think it was around 2000 because it was the same therapist I was seeing um, concurrently with Dr. Nasser. I went back for treatment um, later on. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to follow up on something the judge mentioned. Do you remember what year it was when you told your mother about the external genital body and touching? Oh. That was until around 2003. Okay, so i that And, um... Was there any particular reason that you and your mother didn't report Dr. Nassel to any anyone officially, whether it was the medical board, the police, you would say gymnastics, unless you please. At the time we talked to the physical therapist, we really still didn't know what to do with the information. The idea that he could be this prominent physician and was sex and was a sexual abuser, a prolific sexual abuser. 
was so almost inconceivable. We were still trying to figure out how to reconcile. I, in particular, tried to figure out how to reconcile who he was supposed to be with what he was doing. Um, I wanted, I still was not 100% confident because I hadn't disclosed um, to be able to confidently say at this point that everything he had done was sexual assault. And a very significant part of the dynamic because I knew that I wouldn't be believed. Why did you think you wouldn't be believed? Because I wasn't a test case. His movements were very rehearsed. It was something he did regularly. I was not his first victim, and that meant a couple of things. If I was not his first victim and this was something he did regularly, there was no way that there weren't red flags and warning signs. There was no way that other victims hadn't said something and been silenced. I was very confident of that. Did you think you would be silenced? Absolutely. At the time that you're gaining this knowledge, are you still a teenager? Yes. Still living with your parents? Mm -hmm. Did there come um, a point, Rachel, that you began uh, coaching young gymnasts? Yes. And was this still at the gym that you were affiliated with the problem to? No, that gym merged with another gym um, shortly, but just a couple of months probably after I finished seeing Dr. Nasser. Did there come a point where you disclosed what had happened to you and, and did so in a manner that would reveal that it was inappropriate yes. to someone affiliated at your gym? Yes, I did. And who was that person? I talked to the head coach of that gym, Trevor Alex. Was that your coach as well? She was my coach. At that point, I had transitioned to coaching, and so she was training me to coach. What did you tell her? Um, she wanted to send a little girl that I coached to Mary Nasser for her treatment. And I felt at that point that I had to at least try. I had to try to get someone to believe me, because I couldn't let that happen to my little girl. And so I had a meeting with her, and I told her that he had sexually abused me under the guise of the medical exam. I told her that he was physically aroused during the treatment, and I told her that he had massaged my breast, and I asked her not to send my little girl him. How old was this genius? She was, I believe, seven. Did she listen to your warning? She went home and talked to um, her boyfriend who lived with her, who is now her husband. He is a, he was a police officer, um, and he did everything he could to see if there were any other reports about Mary Nasser. He, he researched, and she called her mom. She found, uh, got more information from mom. Mom confirmed that she had also seen his erection. She confirmed what I had told her, that I had also disclosed the same information to her. And then Trevor asked me how I could have let it happen, why it happened, and how that could have possibly happened with my mom in the room. She told me that her husband had not been able to find any other evidence that many other women were saying the same things, not a hint of a complaint. Um, and I found out a few days later that she had still sent him to, had sent my little girl to him. And then she cautioned me against speaking any further because she was concerned about the ramifications of the family. Uh, the gym owners were very good friends with Larry Nasser. He was actually overseeing the rehabilitation of an injury that the gym owners had, well, wife had. I want to follow up on a couple of things that you just shared with us. Um, you, I believe, testified that she asked, she asked you how you could let this happen. It was that type of a question, and it was not accusatory or malicious. It was more trying to make sense of how is this possible, that type of a question. What was your reaction to that type of question? It was not malicious on her part, but it was crushing to me. How so? Because I already blamed myself. The questions that she asked are the same questions that haunted me when I lay down every night. And to have that verbalized and to have it communicated that my worry was not enough to keep a little girl out of the pedophile's exam room solidified to me that no one was going to listen. There was nothing I could do to protect that little girl. What effect did that exchange with your coach and the knowledge about her police boyfriend looking into him? What what effect did that have on you in your desire to come forward at that time? It confirmed there was nothing I could do. If I couldn't get a friend, I, I knew her boyfriend. If I could not get a friend who was a police officer to believe me, there was no way. There was no way that anybody else would. Do you know if she warned the other family about what you told them? She did not warn anyone. Do you know if that other child was seen by Dr. Nasa? She was seen for one visit in the front on, but I did not know until after it was done.
when your coach mentioned um, or advised you against letting the gym owners know about that, what was your reaction to that? And again, confirmed no one is going to hear, and and that there will be repercussions if I speak up. I was very, very certain that if I tried to come forward and failed, the only thing that would happen is that Larry Nasser would know he was empowered to continue with using, and I didn't want that to happen. Were you employed by those gym owners as I was at that time? Yes, I was. Do you have any concerns about your employment with them if you made waves? Disclose to them what you had said about Dr. Nelson. I think it, I think the coach that I disclosed to is correct. I think it could have been very damaging. That would not have kept me from reporting. If I had seen the tunes, if I had been believed, I would have reported immediately. Did there come a point where um, In late 2003, that you saw um, a physician's assistant by the name of Sherman Sanders yes. for um, some OBGYN mm -hmm. um, a visit? Yes. Okay. Tell me um, the significance of that visit with, um, I'll call her Dr. Sanders. I don't think she's a doctor, but, but um, Dr. Sanders. Mm -hmm. She was a physician's assistant for an OB practice. But she was considered to be a doctor? She was a PA. Okay. She was licensed as a PA. I'll call her Miss Sanders. Okay, all right. And what year was this again? 2003. 2003? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do you remember why you came to see her? Yeah, I was having uh, irregular menses and hormone, uh, hormone fluctuations. And did you share with something with her in 2003 that you thought would be important for your treatment with her? Yes, I did. Um, she needed, she wanted to do a pelvic exam uh, because of the difficulty that I was having. Um, and so she had asked about my sexual history. I was still a virgin. Um, and so I told her I was still a virgin, but I had medical treatment by a physician at MSU. And this is the type of treatment he did. And the reason I disclosed that to her was because I was concerned uh, that I would not appear physically to be a virgin because of the penetration. And I did not want it to appear that I was hiding anything from her uh, because I needed her help. Um, what did you tell her specifically, if you can remember? Um, I, I disclosed to her that I was concerned about the treatment that I had received. I told her about the penetration, um, and that I had presumed that it was legitimate intervaginal work, but that I now had questions. Um, I told her the reason I had questions was because he had, on the fifth visit, clearly sexually assaulted me. I told her about the breast massage, and I did tell her about the external genitalia touching as well. Did you give her his name? I did not. Did you identify him in any manner um, when we were discussing this with her in 2000? Yeah, I told her the reason that I had not come forward at this point was because he was a very prominent physician in the gymnastics community. Uh, and I identified him with Dr. Bastiopathy. And did you identify what institution he was um, affiliated with? MSU, Michigan State University. Um, did you discuss with her your concerns? Just did you have with this physical therapist about whether or not this was um, a legitimate procedure? Yes, I did. And um, at some point during an follow-up visit, did you discuss this more with her? Mm -hmm. Did you share with her that you didn't get your blood, didn't get your consent, and yes. chart that? Yes. In fact, was it this visit that prompted you to get your own medical records? Yes, it was. She suggested that I get a hold of them so that she could look through them. She said it would give her a better idea of what type of treatment he had done and whether or not it was legitimate. At the conclusion of this discussion with her, um, did you provide you with some um, resources or information? What to do with this information? Mm -hmm. Yes, she suggested that I report him to the medical board and then they gave me the paperwork to do so. Mm -hmm. Did you all do that? I didn't. Why not? Because I was confident I wouldn't be believed. And I also knew that reporting to the medical board could not keep me anonymous. And that at that age, I was not ready for this. In the fall of 2003, um, 
after you kind of had educated yourself, after you got this information, were you able to, to move, move on or move past what had happened to you? Yeah. Did you keep a journal during this time frame? I did around 2004 when I finally decided, determined that I had to, I had to deal with it. I had to move towards healing. Very, it wasn't working anymore. In the course of um, keeping this journal, did you make reference to the defendant and what he'd done to you? Yes, I did. Tell me, when you were keeping this journal, what was the purpose? It wasn't something anyone was ever supposed to see. Um, I was charting what I was feeling, um, what I was thinking, um, writing down what I felt I needed to express, trying to process um, the thoughts and the emotions to, to move to a place that was healthier. Did you expect that it might remain private? It would just be kind of you and your thoughts on paper to work through this? Yes, I put it in a little folder um, with an Andy and um, some babies on the front because I thought if it looked happy and innocuous, people would leave it alone even if they found it. How long did you continue to journal and write about what it happened to you? Probably not too well, intermittently. I journaled extensively, relatively extensively in 2004 and then periodically up until my marriage. And within that journal, did you talk about um, the specific things that happened to you? Um, I did not talk about all the medical details, but yes, I did talk about the assaults and the impact that it had. Describe for me, if you can, the impact that it had on you. Both, I guess, shortly after it occurred and in the intervening years. Mm -hmm. There's not an area of my life that's not affected by what my master chose to do. It destroyed my ability to trust. It destroyed my ability to see physical contact as, uh, as good, as innocent. Um, because my trust was used as a weapon against me, the only way I could see to protect myself was to not trust ever again. And so I put up a lot of walls. I kept people away. Um, I found that I had a lot, of, um, a lot of fear, a lot of flashbacks, a lot of nightmares. Um, even with contact, that should be innocent. Mm -hmm. If someone reaching a hand, someone standing behind me, um, because there was so much contact that I had chalked up as innocent, that I had, that I had convinced myself was innocuous, um, that I couldn't let myself trust any physical contact anymore. It, it was a huge weight over my 25th birthday, because I had looked up the statute of limitations, and at the time I looked it up, it had not been removed yet, and I knew that I had 10 years from the date of the sexual assault um, to report. And so the night before my 25th birthday, I sat up all night and considered whether or not there was any chance of being believed. And when I woke up that morning, the first thing in my, in my head was, I lost a chance. I can't stop him now. When you were talking about the statute of limitations, you were talking about the criminal statute of limitations? That's right. Did you ever anticipate or expect that when you were 25 that you would be in this spot today? I thought I was impossible as far as I knew it expired on the 25th birthday. I want to go back over a little bit of the effect that this has had on you. Um, would you say that it still affects you today? Absolutely. You mentioned to us earlier that you're married. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Can you tell us, does it have an effect on your marriage and your relationship? Yeah, because um, my husband was the first person that I had ever dated. Um, and even in our dating, it was very, uh, very difficult. I did not tell him that I trusted him until shortly before we were engaged because I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to say those words. Giving some of your trust is giving him a very powerful weapon, and I learned that the hard way. Any kind of physical contact with him was very difficult. Um, the first time we had hands, um, it was very frightening for me. Um, not because there's anything sexual about holding hands, but because it's giving someone access to you physically. And I know where that can lead. I know what that can do now when you give someone your trust and you give someone access to you. And so it was, it was a significant factor that we had to work through dating. It was a significant factor we've had to work through in our marriage. Um, and because of having to revisit and relive this, it remains a significant factor. Were you concerned at all about how he would see you, your husband, because of what happened to you? Yeah, I was concerned um, that he wouldn't be able to handle it. And I was concerned that he would see it as my fault. 
because I haven't thought that. Has it had an effect on you as a mother of children? Yes. Describe for me what effect that's had on you, that this has had on you in relationship to being a mother. In, in addition to simply fear for my own children, that they will ever experience something like this, it's made it very difficult um, to seek medical care for them, um, particularly from physicians who are male. There's, there's one of my daughters has some pretty significant allergies and eczema, and there's a particular physician uh, who specializes in those things, and I think, based on my conversations with him, that he would be very helpful for the issues that we're dealing with my daughter, but his personality is eerily similar to Larry Nasser's personality, and I cannot bring myself uh, to bring my daughter back to him. In your own medical care and treatment in the last 17 years, has it had, has your experience of what Larry Nasser did to you had an effect on that? Yes, significantly. Shortly after I finished seeing him, I needed surgery for my wrists. And the only physician that could do the type of surgery I needed in Kalamazoo was male. And the time frame leading up to that surgery was terrifying for me. I had recurrent nightmares. I was terrified to be under anesthesia with a male physician in the room because I knew I wouldn't be able to defend myself. And I also knew I had no choice because he was the doctor I had to see for my wrist. That has continued to be a significant factor in seeking medical care. I see female physicians as much as possible, but it's not always possible. I have needed to have x-rays of um, my lungs and my ribs following on the birth of my children. I had a male x-ray technician that was very difficult. Um, I've had to see some doctors in x-ray uh, or in emergency rooms or urgent care facilities over the last 16 years. And uh, just, I had to see a pulmonologist um, because I'm a severe asthmatic. So even, even simple things like having the need to listen to my heart or to listen to my lungs are very difficult. It was a very significant factor in the birth of each of my children because while I had a female OB, there is no guarantee that it will only be females in the room. And there is the realization that at some point during labor and delivery, I become, because of the pain, becoming a position where you lose your inhibition and you're not able to defend yourself. And the, the shadow that that cast over the births of my children, what should have been one of the most joyous events in my life, was very significant. Rachel, you mentioned that um, one of the lasting effects that you've had is, has been um, nightmares. Can you tell me more about that? Um, I have several three different nightmares. Um, sometimes they're of Dr. Nasser, and what happens sometimes they are that people that I trust are abusers. Um, and those continued one to two times a month. Um, but when I came forward and reported, I had them every night for over three months. Has it been easy for you to come forward and speak publicly about this? No, it's been hellish. Tell me what effect it has had on you to be so public about what has happened to you. It feels like you're living it with an audience, and the only thing worse than sexual assault is having an audience to it. Do you feel still blame yourself? No, I don't know. Did you feel any kind of guilt or shame associated with what happened to you? For years, yes. Is there an area of your life that you can tell us where this has not affected you? No mm -hmm. you, you told us that you're um, a licensed attorney. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? That's correct. Did, you have, did this have any effect on you while you were um, studying to be an attorney? Yes. Um, well, when I studied criminal law or um, certain aspects of civil litigation, and we had to discuss sexually motivated crimes, that was very very painful, very difficult. I would often um, wrap up in a blanket so that I could try to feel safe while I studied those areas of the law. I also had some instances uh, with the, with the, in orientation where we went for, for an extensive or intensive week. Um, and there was a particular student there who was very interested in me and very um, vocal about what he liked. And he would, he would call me around, he was sexually harassed. Um, and the memories that that brought up and the level of fear that that created uh, made it very difficult 
to focus on, on my academics made it very difficult to complete that conference. It was something I dreaded. Being with him again for the conference the next year, I squashed it and he dropped out so I didn't have to deal with it. Um, but it got to the point by the fourth day of that week that I, I could not even eat anymore. And it was, it was known as best my other classmates, one of them asked me if I was anorexic, having known my background in gymnastics. Um, it was not anorexia, it was, the fear was just so pervasive because of all the memories that brought up being around someone who was, who was also harassing. Did it have an effect on your professional life? Yes. You working? Yes, I worked at the Michigan Capitol for a couple of years. And I, and I still find it very difficult to be in close spaces with my co-workers. So you get a copy room, that sort of thing. It was very difficult um, when we would study public policy issues or issues would come up um, that related to sexually motivated crimes. Um, I would carpool up to Lansing um, with two or three of the other men who worked there um, from Michigan. And one of them would always sit behind me. He was being very gracious and gentle on me. He would let me have the front seat and he would sit behind me. But he would move forward to talk to a driver. Um, and that was very agitating for me and made me feel very unsafe to have someone behind me because Larry was always watching me. What did you think of your reaction to what happened to you? I tried to make sense of it. I couldn't understand why I froze. I felt a lot of guilt for having trusted, for having been so stupid, is what I really thought. What about in the subsequent years? What did you think about how you were processing it, how it was affecting your life? I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah. Sure. Did you think that your reaction was um, <coughs> Was, was appropriate or consistent with what you would experience? Um, there was quite a time frame where I felt that the emotional, because they were sexually motivated, they did not bear any resemblance to any form of interpelvic treatment. That was something I discovered over the last 16 years of my research. That they bear absolutely no resemblance. And also because Larry Nasser denied in my Title IX report doing international work, and he denied to be start doing international work. He claims he does only technical penetration, and what I experienced was not technical penetration. You mentioned the NDTV Star Report. I want to point your attention back to August of 2016. Did at some point you become aware that there was an investigation um, conducted by reporters from the Indianapolis Star related to U.S. agent masters? Yes, I saw the report that they issued. Is that the first report that was issued? It was. And how is it that you knew or read this? It was trending in my Facebook feed. And what was your reaction to that first report? I was right. If they covered up the coaches' abuse this way, they covered up Larry Nasser's too. And just so we're clear on that first report that you read, was there any mention of Dr. Larry Nasser? No, it was specifically the coaches. Um, what did you decide to do after reading that article? I wanted, I wanted to get this job right away. I wanted to alert them to be looking for his name. At the time I went to Indy Star, I did not know that the statute of limitations for filing a criminal complaint had been lifted. And so I sent um, the, the tip on the email, and I said I was not abused by a coach. I was abused by the national team physician. And I gave them his name, and I told them a little bit about what had happened. And I told them in that email, I cannot report to the police. The statute of limitations has expired for me, but I will do whatever I can to make this stop. How exactly did you report what had happened to you to the Indianapolis stop? I told them I was sexually abused from the guys in medical treatment by Larry Nasser. Okay. Um, let me be more specific. Was it done through a phone line, a tip line, in person, or some other mechanism? It was the email. Okay. And um, do you remember when that was? I believe it was in August. August 4th. It was August 4th. 2016? Yes. Did at some point you re receive a response back from any investigative reporters from the Indianapolis Star? Relatively quickly, I received just a very simple thank you for your tip. We'll be in touch. Um, and that was all I received in a couple of weeks. What was the purpose for reaching out to those reporters? 
I told them that I wanted to alert him to his name, and my hope was that as they were sifting through these coaches' files, that, that USAT had buried anything on Larry Nassar, that they would be able to find it. Did there come a point where you um, found out that others had also come forward? A few weeks later, Mark Alasia from the Indy Star um, emailed me and he said, we've heard now from two other women um, that, have, that have said the same name and we would like to interview and that's all he told me. And Mark Alicia is the, one of the investigative reporters that did the, the, the large piece. That's correct. correct. Um, what were your thoughts about um, speaking to this reporter at that time? Um, I had researched Indy Star and the reporters that were on the team pretty extensively um, to be sure that they were legitimate in their techniques, um, that they had high ethical journalism standards. I had done everything I could to look at what they had done with the, uh, with the interviews and the, and the research into USAG, um, because I did not want to speak up if it was not going to be handled properly, and I think I did not want to speak up if I couldn't make it stop. Did there come a point where you decided to meet with those reporters? We did an initial phone interview a few days later, and then I did give them permission to come down and to record an interview. Was there a decision made by you at some point about whether to um, share your story anonymously or whether to, to give them permission to use your name? Mm -hmm. I decided to give them permission to use my name and, and my identity. Why is that? <laughs> Because Larry Nasser was in such a position of authority and he was surrounded by such powerful institutions that I was confident an anonymous voice would not be enough. Somebody had to meet him where he was most comfortable and do it publicly and in a way that left no doubt. And I also thought it was very important to give other victims hope and to give them a voice. And I am a victim and I know that you don't talk unless you think you're safe. And I felt that they would need a name and a face to know that they were safe to come forward. Was it easy for you to make that decision to go public? No. Tell me about that. There was a sense in which I had no choice because that's what had to happen. And I knew that's what had to happen. But doing this publicly has been excruciatingly painful. It has greatly compounded the effects of the sexual assault. It is not a move someone takes because they want healing. I reached, a, I think, a good place of healing years ago. This is not me finding my voice. This is me trying to protect the one I couldn't protect for 16 years. I couldn't do anything for 16 years. And when I saw that Indy Star story, it was the first hope I ever had that someone would believe and that this could stop. And I wanted to do whatever I could do to make that happen. And there are things that are more important than what I want and more important than the cost to me. And that is protecting the other women and children if the chance ever arises to do it. Has there been a cost to you by being so public with what occurred to you? Yes. Tell me about it. I feel like I have ruined my abuse with my ears. Details about me and my body that no one was ever supposed to know are out there forever now. I had an experience where my phone popped up a little window and my five-year-old son saw it and said, that's you, Mommy. Yeah, that's me. And I live with the reality that my son is going to find these details someday, that my baby girls are going to find these details someday. It is very painful for me to have my father getting updates about what happened to his daughter from his male co-workers, to have to send emails to my close friends and family who I had never told and say, this is something I've never shared with you, but this is going to be in the media pretty soon, and this is why I made that decision. And to have to disclose that to every person in my life. To have to know that everyone I meet. An experience recently when we had we met someone and we went to try to find me on Facebook, and of course when I Google my name, the first thing that pops up is all this information that no one was ever supposed to know. I have recurrent nightmares of being exposed before large groups of people because that's how I feel all the time now. The cost has been great, but there is something that matters more. I know that that interview that you gave with the Angel Star is <coughs> the only interview that you've given. Is mm -hmm. that accurate? Yes. Can you describe for me what motivates you to continue to give interviews knowing that it has this effect on you? Um, part of it is because we reach other victims. It is a way to reach others that are that are living in silence and that are living in fear. 
And the other reason is because this is so much bigger than my answer. There are institutional dynamics that are at work that allowed him to continue abusing for decades, and I have a responsibility to speak to those when I can. I can stop him, but I can't stop the person who rises to take his place if I don't talk about why he was able to continue abusing. Just so that I'm clear, did there, at the time that you did the interview with the Indy Star Post, was that before or after you reported um, your abuse to the Michigan State University Police Department? It was before, but only yet because I hadn't gotten a meeting yet. We had a meeting scheduled at that point, but we hadn't made the trip up to Michigan yet to do it. So you had already reached out to the police at that point. Is that accurate? Yes. As soon as I found out um, that the statute of limitations had been lifted for criminal sexual conduct in the first degree, um, I reached out immediately. Um, did you at some point come into contact with Detective Sergeant Andrew Lundford from Michigan State University Police Department? Yes, she's who I was referred to. And at some point, did you meet with her and give a statement um, in late August of 2016? Yes, I did. Did there also come a point where you met with investigators from the Office of Institutional Equity at Michigan State University? Yes, I did. Did you also um, report to them what you had reported to Detective Sergeant Lundberg and what you testified here today? Yes. Did there come a point um, that you made the determination to uh, retain civil uh, counsel in this case? I did. Just a few months ago, months ago. yes. Um, do you remember exactly approximately when that decision was made? I think it was February, in January, early February. So months after you reported that to the Michigan State University yeah. System. Can you describe for me in very general terms what was the motivation? in seeking civil um, counsel and representation? It was because the information kept coming out about the institutional cover-up with the OSAG and OSU both. And I feel like um, there is a responsibility to have a part in that reform process. The reality is that pedophiles are routinely allowed to continue preying on children because of the institutional dynamics that make it possible for them to. And in the way we deal with that in the U.S. is through the civil process. When it became apparent that criminal charges could no longer be brought for the failure to report in um, MSU and USAG and for how they enabled Larry Nasser to continue molesting little girls, I felt that I had a responsibility to take part in the process of institutional reform. And so I did sign on to the civil lawsuits at that time because that is the way that we do that in this country. Did you also make um, a decision that you were comfortable uh, as, at that time in January, being um, known publicly for both the criminal report that you made and the civil occasion? Again, it's very difficult for victims to speak publicly. We do not often get the chance to talk to victims about why things have happened and what needs to change. I had already relinquished my right to privacy and my right to dignity and everything. There was nothing left I could protect. The only thing I had left was my ability to advocate for change. And that is best done without a name and a face. Rachel, is this an easy thing for you to do? No. And when I say this, I'm talking about testifying for it. Is it easy for you? to be here today and tell us what you told us. No. Is it easy for you to give those um, interviews in public and no. talk about those details? I have my rings before and after every press interview I give everyone. Is it something you enjoy? Is it something that you seek out the no. attention or the proposed fame associated with your story? No sexual assault victim wants attention drawn to the parts of their body they want to hide forever. Is what you told us the truth? Yes, ma'am. Everything that you told us something that happened to you, that Mary Nasser did to you. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Is there any doubt in your mind those effects that you talked to us about that that they've had on your life, with your family, with your children, with your um, own struggles. 
that that mental anguish is a direct result of what happened to you. I understand that. How do you know that? Because he's the source that I didn't have it before then. Because the memories I have are of him, the nightmares I have are of him. I have no further questions at this time. So it's almost 10 after 11. We've been going pretty uh, strong. I think we started probably close to 9. How are you doing? I'm fine. So probably the thing that makes sense is even if Ms. Smith were to take half the bomb at a time, it would push us into the lunch hour. So I think what I'm inclined to do, and you guys tell me whether this works for you, is to perhaps take a break. Now, either we can take a early lunch break or take sort of an extended break, maybe until like 11.30, and resume with cross-examination, or you can have the lunch hour to prepare your cross, and we can actually break early for lunch and come back early for lunch and do it that way. You are really asked to break now for lunch and just come back early for lunch. Just so that it doesn't break up my cross into two parts. I'd rather just do the whole it's thing at once. I, I defer to the court judge. Okay. So I ask that you stagger the appearance of your witnesses as well. How soon will the next witness be here? For she, she's here already. She's already we have here. two witnesses who are present, yes. Okay. So then it makes sense for us to just go ahead and break early for lunch. Why don't we just go ahead and leave at this point? Actually, I think I'm going to have a little bit of an extended lunch. Instead of coming back at 12.09, we'll come back at 12.30. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
I do not remember the names. I saw some doctors at Kalamazoo Valley Sports Medicine. I, believe, I think that's what it was called, KVSO. Do you recall how many doctors you saw there? I believe just one. And do you know how many appointments you had with that doctor? Uh, just a few. When you saw that doctor, did they do x-rays? I don't think they did at that time. No, not that I recall. Had you been referred by, those, by that doctor to physical therapy? No, not at that point. What was the reason that you switched from going to that doctor and transferred over to Dr. Nasser? Because the best they could give me, I had actually initially intended to see mainly for my wrists, was what the, the other doctors were treating. And the best they could tell me at that point was to rest. And so I took two months off of gymnastics to some ballet. Um, and when I came back, the pain continued. Um, and so that was, that was their counsel to me, was just to continue resting and see if it went away. Were they the doctor that referred you to Dr. Nasser, or was that somebody else? No, that was someone else. Okay, and who was that that referred you to Nasser? Um, well, I mean, we were aware of him anyways, but it was an older gymnast in my gym and her mother. And when you say you were aware of him already, it's because he's known throughout the gymnastics community as the, the best doctor to see for uh, gymnast issues, correct? Correct. And that would be true for wrist issues, back issues, hip issues, foot, I mean, in all areas of the body. He was known to treat athletes and specifically gymnasts, correct? Yes. Um, prior to going to see Dr. Nasser, how long had you been experiencing pain? And if you could just describe what the symptoms were, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Probably for six to eight months, um, I was experiencing pain in my wrists um, with, with any movement or any kind of lifting. Um, the back pain was more radial. There were times I would wake up with a pinched nerve, so I would have residual um, numbness or tingling in one of my legs. Um, so it was very painful to do anything that required um, bending the wrist or bending the back. Okay, and I believe your medical records showed you were also experiencing what sounded like some numbness and some <laughs> scary symptoms that needed to be really investigated. Is that true? Yes. Okay, and that was true too for your wrist. You were experiencing some numbness and some pretty serious problems. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> okay, so when you went to see um, Dr. Nasser, you understood, and I think you've described him as the gold standard, correct? Yes. And you said that you were familiar that he had his own conditioning model. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. And that he had written books on the subject. Just a second, maybe this will be helpful for you. If he's out, uh -huh. There's no way to actually interpret whether that's sure. yes or no. That's why 
they'll stop you to have you correct that. So just because we're creating a record, it makes it difficult to have a response like that. It's almost like it's not responsive. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, with respect to the conditioning model you mentioned, can you just tell me about that? I had not read the book myself. I was aware of it because of an upper level gymnast um, from a different gym that had been severely injured and the story that went around our local gymnastics community was that when Dr. Nasser treated her that he had told her that he told her if you had followed my conditioning model um, this injury was preventable. Okay and so at that point you sought Dr. Nasser's treatment um, correct with your mom to go with your appointments. Yes. And the appointments for you to get from Kalamazoo to Lansing, you're traveling over an hour to get to these appointments, is that right? Yes. Okay, but that was something you wanted to do because you knew him to be the best doctor in this area. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Now, um, at the first appointment, um, <coughs> Dr. Nasser did tell you some things about what he was going to be doing to you in that appointment. Is that correct? Some things, yes. So, for example, he told you he was going to need to rotate your hips prior to having any physical contact with your body, correct? Correct. It was your testimony earlier, though, that you don't believe he explained to you what exactly he was going to be doing. Is that fair to say? Correct. How he was going to rotate the hips. Okay. And each time that Dr. Nasser was doing these maneuvers on you in different things, um, he was asking you, are you okay, does this hurt, questions along those lines, correct? He would ask, am I hurting you, Rach? He would whisper it. That was the only feedback he requested. Okay, so am I hurting you, Rach? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and each time you would respond to him whether or not it was hurting him, and he just continued on doing what he was doing with his procedures. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And it's fair to say that the procedures he did seemed very rehearsed to you. They were, it seemed like procedures that he had routinely done over and over. Is that correct? That is correct. So as he moved through them, there wasn't any taking breaks or anything like that. It was a very fluid exam and a very fluid um, set of maneuvers that he was doing to you, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And now looking back, you believe that that the fluid movement of going through the procedures is something he had done to many, many people. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and at all times, while Dr. Nasser was doing the procedures to you in the examination, your mom was physically in the room, correct? Yes, yes she was. And I understand that there's discrepancies about what she can see or not see, but there wasn't any time that he said to her, I'd like you to leave the room or I'd like to be alone with your daughter to, to complete some of the exam I have to do, correct? Correct. Um, also, prior to going to that appointment, you were aware that some doctors did vaginal manip manipulations and vaginal adjustments, correct? Yes. And you said your awareness about those types of procedures came from a friend who had actually had them, that done to them before, correct? Yes. You don't have any medical textbooks or textbooks about those types of procedures and how they would be done or what you could expect to happen, correct? Correct. And this is back in the day before Google was huge, so my other assumption is you're not on Google, you know, looking up these techniques, Googling them and getting information. Is that fair to say? Correct. So really the only knowledge you had about these kinds of vaginal techniques being used were from bits and pieces you had heard from other people about the treatments they received. Is that correct? Yes. Did you have any other information from anywhere or had you done any other research at that point about those types of treatments? No, I had not. Okay, thank you. So when you went to see um, Dr. Nasser, it's fair to say that you were surprised by some of the techniques he was using on you, correct? Yes. And while you were surprised by those techniques, you did not ask Dr. Nasser, hey, can you explain to me what you're doing? You didn't ask any questions like that, correct? Correct. You also did not ask any of the nurses around, you know, is this typical or can you tell me what to expect from Nasser? Nothing like that. Correct. And after some of the appointments, when you had some ideas of discomfort in your mind, you never had your mom call back and say, could you explain this to me a little better? And you certainly never called back and said, can I get some further explanation, correct? I didn't feel it was necessary since I knew that was a form of treatment. Okay. Since you believed it was a form of treatment and a legit form of treatment, you did not call to follow up to ask for the specifics. Is that a fair statement? Yes, that's correct. Okay. As far as... Um, 
the treatments were going then, you had these five experiences where your, your genitalia were involved. Those were the only five appointments where that kind of contact took place, correct? Correct. After those five appointments, all of the other appointments you had subsequently were for your foot or other areas of the body that did not require any kind of vaginal treatment. Correct. Okay. And when you were at the... Um, Does that question actually presuppose that any of the treatments actually require vaginal manipulation? I'm sorry? I said the fact questions presuppose that any of the treatments actually require vaginal manipulation. The way that you phrased it, it was sort of to imply that, and this, and maybe I'm just reading too much into the question, I'm just trying to pay attention to what's going on, but it seemed that that's what you're suggesting about the question, that that somehow well, that let, me, let me ask it a little bit differently. Okay. When you were initially treated with Dr. Nasser over those five appointments, um, and I'm talking about the times where your genitalia was touched, he was treating you for issues that included problems with your hip, problems with your back, um, problems really with what I guess I would term the core of your body. Do you agree with that? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and also he was treating areas that are closely connected such as the glutes um, and, and your hamstrings, things like that, that are all right in this core area as I'm pointing to. Very messily on the record, but trying really hard here. <laughs> it's very charming, it really is. <laughs> Um, I don't think the clitoris is connected to that, so I would I would take exception with that. Okay, I'm, that's not what I asked though. My question was about the parts he was treating that you were seeking treatment for, included your glutes, your back, um, the area around your core. Is that correct? Um, glutes and back. No, I was not seeking treatment for any abdominal or frontal pelvic pain. Okay, thank Ms. you. Ms. Smith, are you actually sort of asking, is the area involved from the shoulders to the knees? That's a fair question. Would you say that the area involved was between your shoulders and your knees? Sure, that would be a fair assessment. And the later treatments that you had involved areas that were outside of the shoulders to the knees. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. I'm Thank sorry. you. Yes. And so that's when you had a broken foot, for example, and went to subsequent appointments with Dr. Nasser. Yes. Now, when you were going through these five appointments that you had with Nasser, you said most of the treatments that involved your vaginal area took approximately 20 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair understanding? Yes. And during those 20 to 30 minutes, 30 minute intervals, that is when he would be doing the motion you showed on the record mm -hmm. repeatedly as he used his other arm to massage or touch other parts of your body. Is that correct? Yes. After you saw and treated with Dr. Nasser at some point in 2003, you requested from MSU Sports Medicine that they send you your entire file, correct? Correct. Is it fair to say that one of the things that really concerned you was that you did not see these techniques explicitly in your medical records? No. What really concerned me was knowing that I had been sexually assaulted when he massaged my breast, and that caused me to question um, the external genitalia conduct and the rest of the contact. Finding out that they were not charted was further concern, but that was not my initial concern. Okay, and I guess that brings me to an important question is there a moment in time that you can pinpoint that you went from being unsure about what was happening to being certain you had experienced a sexual assault? When he came around the table with a visible erection and breathing heavily and reached up my shirt and massaged my breast with his palm, I was certain, yes. Okay, so that's the moment in time that, that changed things in your mind, is that correct? That is the moment in time I knew I had been sexually assaulted, yes. During that appointment, do you recall Dr. Nazar having to do anything with your ribs um, for medical treatment? No, and I had actually had osteopathic treatment by a pediatrician who did have to treat my ribs, and so I knew what that should have appeared like. Okay. At the same time, though, Dr. Nasser, we've already established, is the gold standard 
has his own way of doing things, has books he's written, correct? Correct. Okay, so your experiences, we can agree, with other physical therapists, other doctors, other people, was never the same as what you experienced with Dr. Nazar. Thank God, no. And it's also possible that part of the reason it wasn't the same is because Dr. Nasser does things differently, correct? Uh, he has a level of expertise because of his training in gymnastics, yes. And Dr. Nasser is one of the people who teaches other doctors how to do these kind of procedures, correct? Correct. You have seen, for example, some of the videos that Dr. Nasser has put together to show other doctors how to do these procedures, correct? Uh, the procedures that are in those videos are not the procedures he was doing on me. I'm going to get to that in a second. You have seen some of the videos that show procedures Nasser is trying to teach other physicians to do, correct? Yes, I have seen some of this. How awesome. many videos of Dr. Nasser's video collection have you seen? Well, Judge, I'm going to object. I don't know how that's relevant to the specific acts that he committed upon her. What he teaches others, what he shows, um, I don't see the connection to the relevancy as to what he did to this particular victim. Your Honor, I believe that the complainant made conclusions based on videos she saw, and I don't believe that she has seen all of Dr. Nasser's videos. I believe she saw a selection of them. And if her belief is further that what he was doing is not legitimate medical treatment, that's highly relevant to this court. And she, she's not an expert. She has no basis to know whether or not it was legitimate. And so I'm just trying to see what she has seen to determine that it was not legitimate treatment. Judge, again, she's testifying as to what occurred to her particularly. Whether he has legitimate videos of legitimate techniques um, is another question. I, d I still don't find the relevancy connected back to her specific acts and what we've charged him for this victim. I want to sustain the objection because I don't find that it's relevant either. However, many videos might be in existence that uh, the defendant as a part of, I don't see how that has any connection to whether or not she is the victim of the allegations that are before the court for purposes of today. So I'm sustaining the objection. Okay, thank you. In terms of determining the medical procedures that we've talked about in those five appointments, you went to great lengths to try to determine if you believe they were in fact legitimate procedures, correct? I would not say that is correct. What I went to great lengths to determine is when exactly actually the sexual assault started. There were certain dynamics that I did know were sexual assault. There were certain dynamics that I questioned. Um, and there were certain things that I felt I needed more information because he was the expert. That you did not believe was inappropriate. Yes, the external massage techniques were techniques that I recognized as some of my other physical therapists eventually used and that you will see in medical journals. Okay, and those were techniques that you also experienced with other treaters that you have gone to? Yes. Again, though, in terms of any question about the intravaginal procedures, the anal procedures, um, the, even the massage to the breast area that you described, you never asked Dr. Nasser, can you explain to me why you did that, or what the purpose was, or what, what supports that this was necessary, correct? I did not. I didn't want to draw any extra attention to it. I felt it was shameful enough. There was also an appointment that you attended one time when you and your family brought, a fr not your family, but you and your family also had a friend ride in the car with you. Is that correct? That is correct. And that friend, um, you were present while she was treated by Dr. Nasser, correct? That is correct. And what you observed during her treatment was the same as the kind of things that would take place to you during your treatment. Correct. And after you and her left the appointment, you discussed how uncomfortable it was or how strange it was. Is that a fair characterization? Yes. And, but there, the things that you had said you experienced were also things that she said she herself had experienced as well, correct? Correct. And in fact, when she experienced them, you were in the same room and your mother was present as well. Is that correct? That is correct. The friend that, that, um, took place with, can I please have her name? You may not. She has asked me not to give it. And you have actually had a, a fight with this friend 
about coming forward in this case. Is that correct? No, I would not characterize it that way. She has asked me to keep her out of it and to the best of my ability, I intend to. Okay. She has not gone to police or gone to um, the Attorney General's office and spoken with them? She has not. If to my knowledge. If at some point a court orders that you release the name, will you provide the name to the Attorney General's office? If the court so orders, I will do so. <clears throat> when you went and spoke to, you said that Treva, she was the head coach of the gym you went to in Kalamazoo, is that correct? She's the head coach of the gym that merged with the gym that I competed for. By the time the gym merged, I was done competing. Okay, and she was the person who has the boyfriend who's a, who was a police officer that looked into the things you had said about Larry Nasser at that time, is that right? That's correct. And this is um, the person who also referred, you said, my seven-year-old, a girl you had been coaching who was seven, to Dr. Nasser for treatment, is that correct? That's correct. She was and, somewhere around that age range. Okay, and that was for um, hip pain, is that right? She was pigeon-toed, and so there was concern that there was hip involvement because of her, of her pigeon toe. Okay, and despite knowing that that referral had been made, you did discuss those concerns with Treva, is that right? I did. You did not say anything to the seven-year-old's mother or father about what you had experienced or what, with Dr. Nasser, is that correct? I did not know her father. I didn't say anything to her mother at that point because I asked Treva to, and I did not know that she had thought until after the gymnast had already seen him. After that appointment had taken place and you were aware, I understand you became aware after the appointment had taken place, did you ever do any follow-up or inquire of them if anything had happened at that appointment? I did not. Um, there was also some indicate. well, your testimony indicated that when Dr. Nasser treated you, he is not wearing gloves, correct? That's correct. And there was not any point in time where you ever asked him, why don't you have gloves on, or anyone ever made any inquiry about gloves, correct? Correct, I trusted him. And it's fair to say that in his uh, the educational videos you have seen, he is also not wearing gloves. That's correct. Those, those videos show external procedures, however, so I would not necessarily anticipate him to be. Okay, on the videos that you saw. That's correct. <coughs> Earlier today when you testified, um, you mentioned that you did not ever have issues with your pelvic floor. Can you explain to me what you meant by that? I never had a diagnosis of a specific pelvic floor problem, such as, for example, urine leakage. Okay. Um, I didn't have a pelvic floor injury such as a tear, as you would expect from childbirth or something along those lines. Okay. So where did you learn what would be an acceptable cause or an acceptable condition that would warrant uh, pelvic floor treatment? Um, I began to do research on my own as I got older. I also eventually had pelvic floor treatment by a therapist who specialized in it after the birth of my third child. Okay, and so so you, you went and saw a physical therapist after the birth of your third child, and that was in part due to a tailbone issue, correct? Yes, in part. Okay, and so you had pelvic work done at that time, but that was by a physical therapist, yes? Who, who was trained in pelvic floor work. Most of the therapists who do pelvic floor work are physical therapists. Okay, but the this is not an osteopathic manual uh, medicine physician, correct? No, but it's the same techniques in the same training schools. As far as you know? Um, with every therapist and professional I've spoken with, yes. Okay. But in the grand scheme of things, you did not consult with an expert in sports medicine with respect to the pelvic floor. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Most injuries to the pelvic floor will require the same types of treatments regardless of how they got there. And I think we can also agree that having an expert in sports medicine like Dr. Nasser is more uncommon. It's not as common as a set of physical therapists that do pelvic floor treatments. Do you agree with that? Certainly. So when you looked at the issues you had, you did not see any reason to have any kind of treatment that may have resembled pelvic floor treatment. Is that a fair statement? I did not see any reason to have intervaginal and interanal and clitoral contact. Yes, that is a fair statement. 
And in, on the same hand, you also did not say, why are we doing this if my symptoms don't seem to indicate this is necessary, correct? My presumption was he knew something I didn't know. That's why I was seeing him. Okay, and it's possible still that he knows something you didn't know with his training and expertise in this field. No, ma'am. That is not possible. No, ma'am. And that is why you firmly, obviously, believe you've been a victim of sexual assault, correct? Yes, ma'am. If you were to have the opportunity to sit down with Natsir and have him explain why things were done or what he saw, you would not be interested in hearing it, correct? There is nothing that he can say at this point, no. Thank you. The treatments that you had with Nasser over the course of those five treatments, it's fair to say that you reported back to Dr. Nasser that those treatments were helping you alleviate the symptoms that you had been experiencing. It is accurate that some of the exercises and stretches he gave me to do did help alleviate the symptoms. Yes, that is correct. Are you suggesting that the stretches and exercises he gave you to do helped but not the physical manual treatments he did on you? I am suggesting that the vaginal thrusting and penetration, the anal thrusting and penetration, the breast massage and the clitoral massage did not help my symptoms. It's also fair to say though that you have these, you experienced these, and you were doing the exercises, so what exactly helped is not something that would be in your wealth of knowledge. Is that fair to say? I think it is fair to say that sexual contact does not treat a uh, does not treat a back injury. I have sex with my husband, and my pinch nerve is still there when I'm done. The treatment you had that included manual manipulations mm -hmm. and exercises that you did at home, there is no way for you to know exactly which part of those treatments made what difference to you. Is that correct? No, ma'am, that is not correct. I have sought physical therapy afterwards and was given the same type of treatments and stretches to do, and those helped to the exact same degree, and in some instances even more, than seeing Dr. Nasser did. And that is when you were seeing physical therapy therapists for other issues aside from your boots not firing and some of the symptoms he was treating, correct? No, he referred me to physical therapy for the same symptoms. Which physical therapist did you see for the same symptoms that you saw independent and separately from any treatment with NASA? Um, I saw the same group. I went back to them a few times when the back pain continued. Okay, so after you completely stopped having any, those five appointments with Dr. Nasser, you treated with physical therapists um, who continued to see you at the same group? Later on, yes, I did. Okay, when you say later on, how much later on, or what, what are you referring to? Probably a number of months, maybe a year. I ended up returning to them for treatment for my back later, once my foot was healed. Okay, and approximately, if you remember, how many sessions did you have with them over time? I honestly couldn't tell you. I mean, there's a number of them, but... After your foot healed, did you return to gymnastics and return to... Did you return to gymnastics? I did. Did you return on a competitive level, or were you, at, or were you coaching at that point in time? Um, I started towards a competitive level. I opted in the end to go ahead and switch to coaching about a year after. How old were you when you switched to coaching and stopped competing? Uh, about 16 and a half. The time that the fifth appointment you had where you you testified that Dr. Nasser touched your breast, um, do you recall presenting with shoulder pain on that day? I did not present with shoulder pain that day. If the medical records indicated you presented with shoulder pain and were checked for that, is that just completely inaccurate? There were some issues with shoulder tightness that we were working on that are reflected in the medical records. I had very inflexible shoulders, and so there was often muscle tightness around that area. And so we were working on that to increase the shoulder flexibility for the purpose of taking the pressure off my lower back. Okay. And so on that day, if there's shoulder pain noted in there, you're saying that may have come from the complaint that you had shoulder tightness? Correct. Okay. And that was an ongoing issue that you had had. Um, the other times that you saw Dr. Nasser when he did not do anything to your breasts or ribs. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Was that issue with your shoulder tightness getting worse, getting better, staying the same, if you can remember between the, you know, essentially the first and the fifth appointment you had? 
it was getting progressively better. He had given me a series of stretches to do daily and in the gym to work on that. The um, Shirley Sanders, who you saw um, when you had a concern that she would believe there was sexual activity, and you described the treatments, where is her office out of, if you can just tell me what city? Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo. Is she somebody that you only saw that one time, or did you see her multiple times? I saw her for some continuing ongoing medical care a few times thereafter. This is a question, if you know the answer, but if you don't, I understand. Do you know why we only got the notes from one of the, or two of the appointments and not anything further? Is that what you provided the prosecution? Um, those are the only ones I requested, but I did transfer to an OB shortly thereafter, so I, I genuinely couldn't tell you after those first couple of visits if I had more with her. She transferred to another practice shortly I, after I had seen her, and so my care transferred to a different doctor. Did you continue treating with her at the new practice? I did not. Okay. What is the um, doctor's office, the name of the group that you ended up transferring to? Um, I stayed with the group. I think it's Bronson Internal Medicine. I'm sorry, what was that? I think it was Bronson Internal Medicine. I was with uh, Wendy Bauer for a while. Okay. At what point, um, or what year did you, you don't have to say where you moved to, I'm just wondering what year you moved out of the Kalamazoo area. Uh, 2012, I believe. 2012? Somewhere around there. So your medical treaters at that time would have been that um, Bronson group or Shirley Standards, or you said Wendy Bauer, is that fair to say? Yes. Are there any other doctors that you routinely saw, like a primary care physician or something like that? The OB served as my primary care. Okay, and I have four kids, so oh, I've been I'm seeing sorry, I didn't for years. Elizabeth, <laughs> I'm sorry, I did see Elizabeth Warren as a PCP. Ladies. Elizabeth medication. Warren? Ladies, yes, ma'am. Ladies, you're both talking at the same time. Oh, I'm sorry. talking at the same time because my system's going to go crazy. So I need I you apologize. to just ask your question, please wait. Take it like a little a beat or so before you start to respond because otherwise it becomes really hard for her to keep up and to keep her notes straight. Sure, thank okay. you. Okay, so um, you said you also treated with Elizabeth Warren who was more of a primary care physician. crime.
why the initial um, place you went was the news, to get the information out. No, the reason the initial place I went was the news was because I didn't realize I could still file a police complaint. When I looked up the statute of limitations back in 2000, when I started to realize what had happened, at that time the statute of limitations had not been lifted. The statute of limitations for criminal sexual conduct in the first degree was lifted in May of 2001, which was after I researched the statute. I never knew that that change took place. Okay. And so you will see in that letter to Mark that I told him I cannot go to the police. The statute of limitations has expired. Okay, and when you say the letter that you wrote to them um, saying that the statute of limitations is, um, had been changed, these are the letters where you literally put headlines on them about what these letters prove, correct? No, I'm referring to the first letter that I wrote to the Indy Star when I alerted them to what Dr. Nasser had been doing. And in that letter, I said to them that the statute of limitations had expired and that I was not able to file a police complaint. Okay, right, but what I'm saying is that you went back and added on descriptions of these, um, you added on descriptions showing that this is how we could prove that you were unaware of the statute of limitations <coughs> back when, she, when you came forward. I brought the original correspondence to the police as part of the evidence package, yes. Okay, but you also took the time to sit down and explain to them why you believed it was relevant and helpful and essentially to build your case, correct? I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I knew what you would ask. And you're an attorney who has the ability to do legal research and put together these things, and so you did spend a wealth of time putting together these things and documenting um, what you believe would make the case stronger, correct? I think when it comes to child, stopping a child predator, every effort should be put in, so yes, I did spend a lot of time. In addition to spending a lot of time um, putting together the law and writing memos and things that you turned over to law enforcement, you also spent a great amount of time researching the procedures um, and the, the medical procedures that Dr. Nasser had used on you and how and why you believed it was not a proper medical procedure, correct? Yes, I thought it was important to communicate very clearly when I came forward. And through those, through that research, you did learn that there is a number of articles out there about pelvic floor treatments, correct? Correct. There is an abundance of research about a, quote, thrust technique, correct? Um, the thrust technique is actually um, something that is different. Oftentimes when the thrust technique is referred, it is referred to as cracking. Uh, it does not refer to vaginal thrusting. Okay. I'm sorry. You are speaking so fast, and I want to get each of the words correctly. You said pelvic thrusting, or what, what was it that you said? There is a thrust technique that you will find referenced in osteopathic um, literature that generally refers to cracking of the joints. Um, or of other techniques that are similar, it does not refer to vaginal thrusting, and certainly not of the type that Dr. Nasser was doing. It also does not involve any clitoral area stimulation, nor does it involve breast massage. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's your understanding of the thrusting te technique based on information you read, correct? No, ma'am, that's my understanding when I consulted three physical therapists who specialized with this literature. I asked them to look at the literature for me. Okay, three physical therapists looking at literature you provided them, these are the conclusions you came to, correct? No, ma'am. These are conclusions that I already had that was bolstered by the continued evidence that I found. Okay. We can agree you have not talked to an expert in sports medicine about the thrusting technique, correct? I have talked to three pelvic floor specialists. I have not talked to a sports medicine doctor. Okay, and the pelvic floor specialists you're talking about are the physical therapists, correct? Correct. You are aware that doctors and physical therapists go to separate schools, correct? I am. Okay. And so you have not gone over these articles and techniques with experts in sports medicine or experts in osteopathic manual medicine. Fair to say? That's correct. You also found information about the feel strip, uh, I'm sorry, stripping technique which includes a gliding pressure that's applied to portions of the body around the vagina, correct? Correct. And that technique is something that you would have only discussed with these three physical therapists. There's a lot drawn from that or when you compare what Dr. Nasser did to what those medical journal articles state is legitimately valid yeah, technique. Can I get you guys to stop for just a second? Can I see counsel? Sure.
Office of Institutional Equity at Michigan State. Um, you also went to meetings with them and discussed these issues with them, correct? So then, and you sent them follow-up. Um, they sent you some materials about videos, Dr. Nasser, and you sent follow-up information about why you agreed or disagreed that those videos complied with what you say happened, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Um, and I'm not sure I understood when this happened. It sounds like you and your mom discussed your memories of being at these appointments. Do you recall the first time that you and your mom had a discussion about what you remembered from the appointments and what she remembered? We discussed when it first came out, when I first told her that he had done the breast massage, and I told her about my seeing him with an erection. She remembered the same thing. When was that conversation that you just described? About 2001. It's about a year later. Okay, so in 2001, you guys had this conversation, <clears throat> and then I would assume, but please tell me if I'm wrong, that you've discussed it with her throughout the years since that happened, and even up until today's date. Actually, not very often. I tend to be a pretty private person, and I prefer to heal privately. So okay. it's not that we've had no conversations, but we have had very little. At the time that you were telling your mother you believed she had a visible erection, that was the first you heard that she believed she saw an erection too, correct? That's correct. Um, after the day where both of you say you saw an erection though, I just want to make sure I'm clear, you did go back to see him many, many more times for your foot, is that correct? No, at the point that that conversation happened, that was after my treatment, my foot was done. It was later on in 2001 when I was done. Okay, but it is fair that the timing was you, you say you saw the erection and went back to have more treatments on your foot, correct? That's correct. You just had not discussed that particular issue with your mother. Correct. And during all of those appointments with Dr. Nasser, um, there was never any type of erection or anything like that, correct? Not in the ones following, no. Thank you. that um, the only thing worse than having a sexual being sexually assaulted is having an audience. <coughs> Do you recall yes. testifying that way? Okay. It's fair to say, though, that when you've been given the option in this case, you are the one who has requested an audience, correct? No, that is not correct. You are the one who wanted all of the cameras in the courtroom and the print paper to be able to stay, despite the fact that the Attorney General had asked they be excluded. Correct. I would be happy to speak to that. The reason that I asked for that was because Judge Allen had already ruled in the former case that at least one camera would be in the courtroom, and I did not want Larry Nasser to walk in here thinking he had won a victory. I want him and I want the public to know that I know where the shame and the guilt for this lies. It lies on him. It does not lie on me, and I am not afraid of the truth. And that is what you have said in your interviews to Dateline, to 60 Minutes, to People Magazine, to numerous other news agencies, is that correct? I have never done interviews with Dateline or 60 Minutes. I was not part of that. Okay, I apologize. You did. You were interviewed by people, and it is fair to say you've been interviewed by numerous news agencies, including Indie Star, correct? Yes, that's correct. He's here mostly with concern to victim age. Is that right, Mr. I believe that to be correct, Your Honor. Okay. In, um, in consultation with counsel for the Attorney General and the defense and my client, the only concern that I have on behalf of WLNSTV in our motion to intervene under MCR 2.209 is the degree to which there may be some restrictions that essentially probably well, would be corrected in court. Exactly. Yes. Yes, I actually sort of entered a, a 
where probably about a week ago, I saw it on the where we had these initial discussions about who was going to be allowed to be president of the courtroom and under what circumstances. And I believe that it was actually something that was sort of joined in by uh, both counsel, both proposing counsel. I don't know that Ms. Smith had a big, huge dog in the fight at that particular point. But what I had essentially ruled was that there was also a very similar motion that had been brought before the Honorable Julie Renegade out in the county. And so with respect to victim A, I had indicated that I would follow the order that Judge Brinkley had entered with regard to who could be present in the courtroom with regard to victim A. Alleged victim A had to continue to make sure that I had that qualifier. So because we're not actually at that point now for us to consider what's going to happen or whether or not Mr. Provides is actually going to call the alleged victim A, I think we'll just kind of table that until we get to that bridge, so to speak. So that, I think that allows you to be able to leave today because she's indicated that she's not going to be calling that person today. So I'm going to call victim A, alleged victim A, on the second day. She is scheduled to be our first witness on that day. I don't know that that will change as, as it relates to our, our well, presentation today. Well, you always have the ability to decide what it is that you want to do, and you can do that at the 11th hour, of course, because you're the one that has to do the case. And so you decide that you don't want to use that person. I don't want to get into a discussion about something that might be moved. And since it might be subject to being moved, we'll just take it up on the day that you intend to call that potential witness. Okay? Thank you. Mr. Nichols. What day is that? Uh, Friday the 26th. Friday, May 26th. Is that right? Alright, the boss says it's on the 26th. Friday before Memorial Day. Does that mean that you're not available? No, I'll be, I'll make this okay. Alright, <laughs> we're, we're very worried, Mr. Nichols. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll advise Mr. Schiller Nichols that plans shall change. <laughs> well, I'll advise him that I'll be available on the 26th. Alright, well, that means that you're not available on the 26th. Alright, let's do this. This is a natural point for us to take a little bit of a breather. We didn't go very long that time. I think we got started right around 1230 or 1235. By my comment, it's now 140. Maybe we should take a little bit of a break and we will come back. How long do you think the testimony is going to take? I think, I, what I can tell you, I'm the worst judge of this kind of question, Judge. Next witnesses, I anticipate, at least from the perspective of the prosecution, be much quicker. Okay. The prior. You think we could actually complete the testimony both? Direct and cross. Of our next victim? Yes. I think so. I absolutely right. hope so. I mean, I can tell you, we have two other victims waiting, right? And I'm hoping we can get to at least one more of them. I would think that that's probably not likely, but we can't really, I mean, we can't limit what it is that might be legitimate in terms of Ms. Smith's cross examination. And of course, she won't know because it's going to be Mr. Mm -hmm. then it's going to be more of a problem than. <laughs> we can leave early if you want. <laughs> I prefer that we stay late, but it's just, it's just <laughs> well, there are union rules and whatnot that apply, so we just can't keep the courthouse open and have security here all night. But I'll kidding aside, I think probably the most we can probably get done today is probably to finish the next witness, and then we can kind of figure out where we're at. The, the chances of us being able to complete two witnesses in the course of less than three hours is probably not going to look So I think we could probably, if we're on top of our game, complete one additional witness, but we'll just see where we're at once we do that. Mr. Nichols. Yeah, I just, before I go, I need to know from the Attorney General if there's going to be a motion to uh, restrict access by the media. I don't know how practical it would be for the media to pull. I'm talking about the and potentially radio, um, how effective or possible it would even be this afternoon to set up a pool. I don't know if that's what's contemplated, but I think that's where it's going. Well, I know in the past we've tried to limit the intimidation factor of having a whole sort of gathering of video cameras. I think that they are sort of obtrusive in terms of how people do them. I think that we're probably comfortable with them, but you know, a potential witness may not be. Do you believe that this person that you're going to have testifying next is somebody that I need to have some greater concerns about with regard to what's going to happen in the, the next sort of go-round coming?
coming up? Or? What I can tell you is this. The next victim is 22 years old. We've explored this with her, her preference, and, and we've requested on her behalf is that there is a limitation. She knows that the likelihood of a closure is not going to happen. Um, I would ask that there be restricted media. I don't know that there needs to be. I see. I don't know. There's, they seem to be pretty well behaved. I don't think that's the problem, Judge, yeah. at all. It's just the mere presence of that, right? Um, the intimidation factor, you believe? I absolutely want to review this motion for the young woman maybe coming after her, which we may or may not get to today. Doesn't sound like we will. Um, because she is a minor, and that is a concern of hers. But as far as this next witness goes, I would ask that if there's a way to limit or reduce the number of cameras in it, and, and perhaps they can collectively share yeah, information. Yeah. So let's see if Ms. Smith has it, an impression with regard to that Ms. Smith. Or Ms. Smith, or whichever one of you want to speak to that. Right, paper, scissors. No, no, we have no objection, Judge. We just have no objection. We have no objection to the cameras being present. And I have not found them to be too intimidating. They have not bitten anyone. They've been behaving. <laughs> I just, I don't think there's any reason. We have adult witnesses why we would keep them out. Anything further, Ms. Corbelitis? Thank you, sir. So I think based on at least what I perceive about what's going on today, I'm going to allow, unless there are people that actually have um, cases out of Washington or something that you need to cover, you know? <laughs> you know what I to say? I think I'm going to allow you guys to stay because unless I get a, an impression from the witness, and her body language, is it, it is a woman, I think. That's right. That maybe I will revisit this question if there does seem to be some apparent intimidation in terms of the number of people that are in the courtroom. I think I'm prepared to allow for everyone to remain as long as everyone remains on appropriate and civil behavior. Okay? Judge, may I request of the court that um, you disseminate not only to the press but to the public that are present um, there's restrictions that we've already placed in the form right. of an order. And the nature of this, uh, the, the nature of this order is, is that everyone can remain, but there should not be any identification of this witness. There shouldn't be any pictures of this person's face or any mention of this person's name. That this is going to be a situation where we're really endeavoring to try and protect this person's privacy. And so, if anyone. It looks like it's all lawyers and, and journalists that are in here in any event. Raise your hand if you're just from the public. So you're not just from the public. If you're just from the public, it looks like there are only four or five people. So everyone understand what the ground rules are. Okay? So with that, I'm prepared to allow for the folks that are here to remain here and then we will just You'll let me know if you sense anything, and I'll be watching with regard to this. Judge, if I may just well. interject, it sure. was not only the identification of her or any other information that might identify her. And I think, particularly with our question, and I know of these witnesses will be careful with that, but with, for instance, their parents' name or where they live, or it, it, you know, things that could potentially, you know, some type of sleuth could figure out who they were. Um, sleuth? Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of like that word. Dick Tracy or somebody. So, nothing about this person should be used outside of this courtroom to try and identify who that person is. Okay? Thank you. That's going to suffice. Yes. Mr. Yes. Nichols, anything else further for you? I'm going to retire in my office. If something comes up, my client can go over. Sounds like an appropriate plan. Thank you. So, let's take a break. We will reconvene at 2 o'clock. Okay? <laughs> Thank you.